Ok. Ok, so we are live again. So I'd like to, to thank uh, for the presence here of Professor Caio Liciardi. It's really a pleasure to, to have you here among us. Uh, so uh, I'm going to, to make a brief introduction about Professor Caio. So Professor Caio is uh, here from Brazil. He made his PhD at University of Regina, Canada. And then uh, he was a research associate at the Carleton University uh, and also uh, the coordinator of the EXO 200 detector. And nowadays, Professor Caio is, uh, is professor at the Laurentian University, Canada, and uh, he's also a postdoctor fellow on the next experiment, I guess uh, that he is going to talk about a little bit of the next experiment for us today. Uh, so if I made any mistakes, Kai, please, you are free to correct me. Uh, but again, thank you so much for your, present, for your presence here and uh, feel free to, to give your talk. Thank you. Um, do you see my slides? Should I make it? Uh... Yes, I see them. Okay. No, thanks. Uh, and I see uh, in full screen now. Okay. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> quero dizer que, uh, não, como você falou, eu, eu sou brasileiro, então eu, eu falo português, entendo português, eu bem, não, aceito perguntas em português, inglês, o que for mais uh, fácil. Eu agradeço a oportunidade, fico muito feliz em falar do trabalho. Uh, mas, uh, como eu falei, acho que eu vou falar o talk em inglês mais por... Não, é o que eu estou mais acostumado a falar quando apresenta esse talk. Uh, uma coisa antes só de começar, é o trabalho nas colaborações ex 200 na EGZO, eu faço também pe outras pesquisas. Eu percebi que o que essa conferência, como ela não é dedicada a experimental ou experimental de neutrino, eu decidi então colocar um pouco sobre a motivação para a física do neutrino, antes de falar do, do EGZO 200 do EGZO, então, infelizmente tem que ficar um pouco mais curto na parte do EGZO 200, mas espero que seja um pouco mais é, claro assim, a parte da introdução e... Bom, eu peço desculpas se de repente for muito rápido em, em algum momento, é só para tentar fazer, é, dar o tempo do, do talk. Ok, so, um, no, to start uh, from the no, introduction, um, we all know the, the standard model uh, is a very successful framework describing you know, the, 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 the known particles and, and interactions. Um, just a second here. Okay, uh, explaining particles and, and interactions. Um, But, but you also know that we, we, we can't answer everything with the standard model. Uh, in particular, you know that there are things we have to hypothesize. Uh, new particles that are beyond the standard model weren't yet uh, detected. Uh, but there are also questions in the standard model that, that is not yet answered, uh, such as you know, whether neutrinos are their own anti-particle, uh, the so-called Majorana particles, or, or even how neutrinos acquire mass, why, why they are so much smaller than the other masses, right, the other part, mass for the other particles in the standard model, and you know, above all, you know, why we are here, right, why, why there's this uh, asymmetry between you know, the, the observed matter versus antimatter in the uh, universe. So, so answering this question is actually you no know, key goal of fundamental physics in the coming years. You know, I mean, we're lucky enough to be in times where we, we think we can attempt to answer questions like that with experiments. Um, and that's sort of a situates the neutrino physics. Neutrinos are these particles where you know, not only it was driving the you know, building of the standard model. Um, sorry, there was a question. Maybe not. Uh, yeah, so not only was driving the, the physics of the uh, standard model, but it was also our first direct evidence to do physics beyond the standard model you know, for the observation or discovery of neutrino oscillations. Um, so at first, the standard model, we hadn't include neutrino uh, masses, right? And that was one of the, let's say, um, 
was one of the uh, inspirations for, for the, the left-handed uh, model. Uh, but then later, you know, soon enough, uh, there was, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, soon enough, uh, we, we, we saw these uh, neutrino oscillations and, and was, you know, there were several uh, explanations for these, but was cemented based on the, their dependence with energy that this uh, implies that neutrinos have non-zero mass and sort of formalized Nobel Prize in, in 2015. Now, in short, you know, this, this, this uh, phenomenon essentially saying that these you know, three neutrinos we have associated to the charged leptons, which are the, essentially the, the, the neutrinos we can say see in detectors in laboratories, right? Um, then we call them the flavor eigenstates. They, they are not the same as you know, if you had a you know, quantum weight scale and you would pass these neutrinos through them, so what the results would be, these would be the mass eigenstates, right? So they are not necessarily the same. Uh, they are actually mixed by, you know, it's a linear combination and the mixing is called uh, the PMNAS uh, mixing matrix, so composed of three angles, three CP phase. So when you know, these neutrinos oscillate in vacuum, what doesn't change is the mass eigenstate, but the combination of mass eigenstates, which are the eigen values in vacuum, you know, the, the combinations, they change. So, so even if you produce only, say, electron neutrinos in some place, you know, as they propagate in vacuum, you know, there is a, a difference uh, in phase of, of the different mass eigenstates. And then later, depending on what the, where you detect, there's more or less chance to detect in electrons again, but also you no know, chances of detecting muon neutrinos or, or, or tau neutrinos. Um, so the experiment set up to measure oscillations um, are, are very sensitive to mass, in fact, um, no, but they are not sensitive to the absolute mass scale, only to the mass difference. So having three neutrino masses, no, we would expect then two difference uh, uh, of masses. And in fact, what they measure is the uh, difference in squared masses, right? Um, no, they, they, they are sensitive to the fact, so these two measurements we have uh, for, for these different masses are you know, indicated uh, here. And they essentially, uh, you know, if you take the square root of these, you get that one of the difference in masses is about 10 milli electron volts and the other one is about 50 milli electron volts. So that gives you an idea, not only that they are very different in magnitude, one is five times larger than the other, but also of the magnitude of the difference of these masses, right? So, so if you were to measure, um, the, the, the neutrino mass uh, scale and you know, say, for example, set at one electron volt, all these three masses would be degenerate, right? Because they, the difference in masses are, are very small. Um, so you know, as we haven't measured this uh, absolute scale yet, this is an open question. Uh, we, we, we don't know whether the neutrino uh, neutrinos are, are degenerating masses or not. But I guess what I wanted to discuss in this slide is also that you know, for the most part, if you only look at oscillations in vacuum, in vacuum, we're not even sensitive to the sign of this difference in mass. We only sensitive to the absolute value of these differences. And that's what happens. So, uh, and, and that can only you know, be disentangled or say, you know, can only be actually uh, decided whether the difference is positive or negative if you have additional effects. So there's, if you, the, uh, also, no, say the, the, the neutrinos travel in matter, then you know, there is this effect we call the matter effects that enhances uh, the oscillation or, or decreases the oscillation depending on the sign. And so we can tell something about this at the sign. And so we're lucky enough that neutrinos producing the sun uh, undergo this mechanism and we can tell the difference in masses between the second and the first one. And we can say the second is larger than the first one. So we know the difference in masses that uh, from neutrinos coming from the sun. So we know the solar uh, mass ordering. We know M1 is smaller than M2. But other you no know, large source of neutrinos, which is coming from cosmic rays, it's called atmospheric neutrinos, that we don't know, right? And you know, we have, uh, let's say, um, human experiments that do a similar measurements called in, in laboratories from you know, uh, uh, neutrino beams uh, that reproduce the atmospheric results, but, but they, again, they are not sensitive to the mass difference. Uh, so we don't know whether the uh, mass tree is heavier than this difference M1 and M2, or if it is smaller. We know it's a big difference from 50 compared to 10 million electron volt, but we don't know whether it's heavier or you know, lighter. Uh, 
we know by the model, because of the model that M3 is a larger fraction of uh, tau neutrinos, right? So tau neutrinos would be primarily composed of M3. So since tau is the you know, heaviest of the charged leptons, you'd expect that M3 is heavier than the others. So, so that's called the normal ordering uh, of neutrino masses. It's also sometimes called normal hierarchy, right? So the, these days there's this ordering hierarchy, you know, uh, two words to, to, to say the same thing here. Uh, so where we are at, at determining uh, how it's the ordering of neutrinos. So we have these days two ongoing long baseline neutrino experiments, um, no one at Japan, the other one, the US. Um, they were designed to measure other things in particular, you know, uh, to measure one of the angles that was not so well known at the time uh, it, it was built, uh, but they can provide us uh, and they are leading you know, in, in, in providing us measurements of uh, you know, favoring or disfavoring the uh, uh, hierarchy, right? And they are both telling us, again, I'm not gonna enter the details here. I'm just, I guess the figure here is to point out, it's, it's a large experiment. You have to create a beam in one side of the country, send it uh, another side of like say Japan, 300 kilometers down, you know, the other side of Japan to do this measurement. NOVA is somewhat alike that. Um, so so they, they provide us a, a, lot of, a lot of information about the neutrino physics. But these particular questions of the you no know, ordering or hierarchy of neutrino masses, they are both pointing to favoring normal hierarchy, right? And uh, so here is essentially the probability of these coming from the experiment TQK 80%, and here is in, in sigma confidence levels from NOVA. So for a long time, these uh, this, you know, have been just kind of uh, getting more and more consistent, these results. But recently, you know, in, in July, Kelly and colleagues, they were analyzing these results. And one thing they realized, maybe this was a lot discussed in, in several conferences, that you know, one of the things T2K and NOVA are built for is to measure an angle of the mixing angles, theta 2, 3, and in particular, what uh, quadrant they are, right? And they don't agree in these, right? They, if you look at the best fit of their data, they favor normal ordering, but NOVA thinks uh, you know, the... So NOVA is actually the blue one. NOVA thinks it's under, you know, the sine square theta 2, 3 is like first quadrant is under 0.5, whereas T2K, you know, favors, you know, above 0.5, right? They're both near maximum at 45 degrees, right? But one is under, the other one is, is above. Uh, but what they realize in this paper is that while they don't agree on these and they both favor normal hierarchy, if you switch the scenario and say they are inverted, then then they agree. They agree in the position of the angle. Uh, so, so maybe this is a hint that perhaps you know, nature has chosen the inverted ordering. So I want to motivate this because this connects a lot with the you know, experiments that EXO200 and EXO does. But before we go there, I also wanted to give some fundamentals of what EXO200 does. Um, so here is explaining what double beta decay is. Uh, we know beta decays is, is, is a process which you know, the nucleus undergoes to make itself more stable, right? To make a, a ratio more stable of protons versus neutrons. Um, there are some cases um, of you no know, same, uh, say, uh, you know, iso uh, isotopes, right? With this, uh, you no know, elements that have the same atomic mass, right? That you no, know, whereas you'd expect that a beta decay to bring the nucleus to a more you know, uh, stable uh, state, it, it actually makes it more energetic. So, so the decay is, is forbidden, right? Because of you know, just energy. Uh, and that's the case for you know, uh, the atomic mass 136, that's the case for xenon. So if you look at the chain you know, 136, the IO9, it, it decays, beta decays into xenon 136. You now here's essentially the binding energy and, and their differences. So we see it's more energetic at iodine, but then it beta decays, uh, it makes it less energetic, but then you know, you'd expect it to beta decay again to cesium 136, but you no, know, cesium 136 is a little more energetic. Uh, the nucleus, so this is prevented from, you know, Know, from essentially energy conservation. So you that doesn't happen, but it doesn't stop there because you no know, barium 136, you no, know, it's two protons uh, uh, extra uh, respect to xenon and it actually has a less energy. So if 
it happens that two beta decays happen essentially at the same time, like simultaneously. Um, this is this transition is allowed and is actually observed. That's that's what's called the double beta decay. So there are two betas in this process, right? So the nucleus, well, the, 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 the the neutron turns into two neutrons turns into two protons and emits two two electrons with two antineutrinos. Um, if you look at the the, the, the diagram for this uh, process, you know what you'd expect. So these are the two neutrons coming in, the two protons, and then you know the two electrons leaving uh, along with the two antineutrinos. Um, but you now, if you suppose that you know, neutrinos are the same particles or the antiparticles. We can think, right? Maybe we, uh, the, that from CPT that the vertex here on top or on the bottom is actually a, a neutrino entering, or as opposed to an antineutrino quitting, and, and it's the same. We can suppose it's the same that that quits this other vertex, right? And then we have this other diagram, which is essentially saying there's a mechanism because neutrinos are their own antiparticles, that it's the same particle that connects these two vertex. That there's some mechanism. So in, in reality, it doesn't matter what mechanism, what's inside here. What matters is there's no neutrino quitting this uh, process, only two electrons, right, along with the two protons. And so this is what it's called neutrinos double beta decay. And if you observe these, you know, there's an obvious violation of the lepton numbers. So, I mean, this being one of the global symmetries in the standard model, this is no, beyond the standard model for sure. So that's physics beyond the standard model. And on top of this, right, so the rate at which you know, the neutrino would go to an antineutrino and vice versa, no, it's, you know, it, it, it scales with the mass of the neutrino, right? So the rate at which would observe this uh, process happening would scale with the neutrino mass, right? So in measuring or searching for these and finding these process, if these exist, right, if neutrinos are antineutrinos, would not only tell us uh, the violation of lepton number, but it would give us hints of the absolute neutrino mass scale, something that oscillation experiments cannot uh, give us. Because kind of going beyond this, so what I'm showing here is usually how we connect in this standard model, the rate at which neutrinos double beta decay would occur. Like this is the, say how you count these, I'll show these later. You count these, uh, number of events happens and you convert this into a half-life. And how that you convert this into a mass that you know, is related to a neutrino mass, but there, there's some mixing because again, it's not one of the mass eigenstates that is involved in this uh, process is, is the neutrinos double beta decay mass that is involved. So it's called the effective neutrino mass for double beta decays. So the in black here is, is usually how we convert. We go from the experiment to our you know, measurement on the mass. One of the coefficients here, what it's hiding is a phase space factor and two nuclear matrix elements. These are very difficult numbers to calculate, but it's essentially you know, dependent on the nucleus and then probability of the nucleus to, 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 to have this process. But you know, having measurements of neutrino double beta decay would you know, allow us to extend the standard model and perhaps make a, a model for generating neutrino mass that is not uh, left no um, favored, but but you no know, left right symmetric, right? And when you do this, then there's all these new coefficients that show up, and you could uh, say, you no. Know, and in these new terms, there would be new coefficients that parameterize the mixing between the, the left right currents and, and and the mass scale of the you know, right handed sector. And, and measuring you neutrino know, double beta decay could could give you then uh, constraints on you no know, say these, these different uh, scales of the new no left, right, symmetric model. So I'm pointing this out. This is a, a video poster uh, of this conference. So I, I guess I'm just advertising this was work done by the news. Uh, so what she was looking here is this constraint done, uh, this constraint in these mechanisms from the next generation of neutrinos double beta decay search, right? Or you know, if they were to see neutrinos double beta decay. So I guess then coming down to back to uh, neutrinos double beta decay. So how do you build a, a double beta decay experiment before I, I, I introduce you know, EXO200 and EXO? So you have to choose a, 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 a nucleid that double beta decays, they, they essentially all beta decay, double beta decays, but you want to choose one that has the beta decay forbidden or, or suppressed. So there are 35 naturally occurring isotopes that, that, that satisfies these. The, the three preferred ones are uh, you know, in the marked xenon-136, germanium, 76 and, and, and recently tellurium uh, 130. 
So you want to build an active detector. You want to, to put this, uh, somehow it can be passive, right? Germanium, just double beta decay. So you have to bring a, 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 some detector to see these decays. Xenon, uh, as opposed, it, the medium is also a detector of, of the decays. And you'd expect to see a nice double beta decay energy spectrum, as we've seen in Exo 200. But then you'll be looking for the neutrinos double beta decay process, which since there's no neutrinos coming out, the two electron energies always sum to the Q value, right? The decay energy uh, value uh, of the process, right? And, and so you'd expect to see a, a peak around the Q value. So here is, is normalized by the Q value and, and, and essentially the rate of events uh, as a function of energy. This is just hypothetical, right? It's taken from uh, some work on, on archive. Uh, the issue here is you now often what happens is uh, there will be backgrounds, right? Backgrounds are something you measure, it looks like, like signal. Uh, and you know, the typical types of backgrounds in these experiments uh, comes from natural uh, decay chains that you find everywhere. You know, the two most, uh, you know, the, the, the two most problematic ones for these measurements are the one from 30 to 32. There is a gamma line, so there's a gamma that pits or it lives in this decay chain uh, with an energy of a 2.6 MeV from uh, the decay of thallium 208. And there is a, a line in, in the decay of uranium 238 from bismuth 214 with a 2.4 MeV. So, so these, you know, if these are above the Q value, essentially, if you don't measure the full energy of the gamma living here, but you measure some part of it, it may be just around the Q value you're looking for your signal. Right? That's one of the best discriminators we have for neutrinos double beta decay process. And, and you know, the background is just uh, being the way uh, of your signal. So what you do in a double beta decay experiment is you, know, you look at a region around you know, where you expect to see your peak from the neutrinos double beta decay. So you try to make this as clean as possible. And then you measure some amount of signal um, and then you use this signal to convert this into a half-life. So, so if there's a background making it to this region, then you're counting background as signal, and that's uh, problematic. So, so when you estimate, so, so you want to subtract these uh, from your measurement. So the more you subtract, the, the less sensitive your experiment becomes. Uh, so, so here's where uh, EXO fits in. Uh, EXO is uh, no, a Richard Zenon observatory. Uh, it is an experimental program searching for neutrinos double beta decay using liquid xenon one thirty six. There are some other programs that use gas xenon. This is, is look, using liquid xenon one thirty six. So the first detector of so these are two collaborations, but the first detector in the program was Exo two hundred detector that ended operations in two thousand eighteen. Whereas you no, know, the new one and proposed based on success of Exo two hundred is in R and D seeking funds for you no know, the full construction. Uh, what are the advantages of Xenon 136 or, or reaching Xenon 136 for, you know, for searching neutrinos double beta decay? You know, first, it's, it's a noble gas, so it's very easy to purify noble gases, right? Because the last uh, electronic shell is, is complete. So it, it's easy to build things that purge all other elements than noble gases. Uh, so often what will come with uh, Xenon-136 as a noble gas, uh, say, no contamination is krypton. But the Q value of the krypton decay is, is way below the Q value for, for Xenon-136. It is at you know, 687 kV. So, it's, so the, it, it's no problem you know, uh, to, uh, as a contribution for, uh, of backgrounds for, for Xenon-136. So the, the technique to enrich is straightforward in the sense that so we can reach Xenon 136 just by putting Xenon in a, a centrifuge, uh, in a centrifuge, and doing centrifugation, and also the heavy elements you now goes to the side, as opposed to say germanium 76, where growing these pure crystals is, is very complicated, and it's the only nuclide we know that double beta decays in which we we know a technique that we could. Um, no, identify that after a, a count, no, the resulting you no know, material has a barium 136, right? We can identify the daughter of the decay. Uh, the, it, we, we can do that, it's, but it's really, really difficult to deploy this onto a detector and to make this work. But we, we, we have a recent paper showing you can you know, bring a, a barium 136 atom and identify uh, it. Uh, so this is still in development, it doesn't really need for the Nexo working. 
and it's you now based on the time projection chamber technology. So having the time, I'll probably cover what it is. Here is the EXO 200 collaboration. Here's the EXO 200 detector. So it was, like I said, was decommissioned in, in December 2018, but was sitting at the WIP uh, mine in Carlsbad. So this is a mine about 600 meters underground. Um, so it, it consisted of you know, a barrel like this. We, we call it a TPC. It's a TPC barrel uh, or vessel you know, of, made of copper. And it has about 40 centimeters in, in diameter and in length. It was, you no. Know, so this is you know, one drawing. This is a, a schematics of what an interaction looks like in EXO 200. So this uh, barrel was split in half by a high, uh, by a cathode that provided high voltage. Uh, and an interaction in xenon is essentially, you know, a, a particle like a gamma or beta would interact with the xenon, would ionize the molecules of xenon in, in, in the liquid xenon. And, and partially this ionization would recombine and uh, produce scintillation light, which is instantaneous detector by photosensors located at the end of each of the you know, sides of the TPC. And the other partially non-recombined uh, electrons from this ionization would then drift from, you know, you have a cathode, you have a, cathode, uh, a high voltage, you have an electric field. This electric field would bring these electrons onto wires. Then you have two dimensions of wires. The first one would just see induction as the wires, as the electrons drift towards the wire. The ones that pass then are collecting the back uh, layer and, and then we can tell the energy of the event. So the energy of the event then was measured in two different ways. We could measure the scintillation light energy. We could measure the ionization uh, energy. Uh, since the more they recombine, the more produce a scintillation, but less ionization and vice versa. When you do a plot of, say, data from a calibration run, such as a torrent 228, uh, you expect to see then sort of this anti-correlation feature. So what we see here is if events measured you know, from this calibration run, you know, the, the scintillation versus a charge, and, and essentially the, the, the width of this island uh, is essentially telling you your detector resolution. So we would use then this anti-correlation rather than, no, so there are two things that are important here. So the, the ratio between scintillation energy and ionization energy is the same for beta and gammas. But alphas, they, they, they fall very far. So, so we don't have any problems of alpha making as a background. Um, and, then the, the, and then the other, so the, the, there's another way to separate beta and, and gamma that I discussed in the next slide. I know I'm running short in time, so I'll make very quick this bit and end the talk. But uh, I, I wanted to finalize the, the EXO 200 results and, and give an idea of, of an EXO. So if you look at the energy spectrum projected for the ionization and, and scintillation uh, channels, they, they provide a, a poor resolution. But if you, you know, because you know of this anti-correlation, you can project this into a rotated uh, axis and it gives you a very good energy resolution. So what I show here is essentially for the EXO 200 detector, our measured energy resolution on a weekly basis for two phases of the detector. Here we have an upgrade in electronics and so there are two colors. You, know, you should pay attention to the red one with the best uh, energy we can get from the detector around the, the Q value. And what I would say is that you know, our intended resolution for EXO 200 was around 1.6 to 1.8, and we managed to make 1.4 in phase one and 1.15 average in phase two. So that's beyond the detector specifications. Uh, just to sort of finalize what I wanted to say in terms of analysis of EXO 200, the way we distinguish between beta and gammas, gammas interacting xenon by Compton, a gamma Compton scatters with xenon, and then you know, it deposits some energy and then travels some distance and, and, and keep going like this. So it, it, it Compton scatters and, and leaves multiple deposits. So we call these multiple site events. Whereas beta, it's only about two, three millimeters they travel in xenon before they completely lose all the energy and they live single sites. So this separation essentially kills 90% of gammas, right? You can separate betas with 90% essentially factor. But there are more things. Gamma usually are not produced in xenon. They come from outside and xenon has you no know, gamma at a 2.5 MeV, has an attenuation length of about 8, 8.5 centimeters. So you can use the distance distribution, right, from the sides to constrain uh, what your backgrounds and signals. And you can also do a fancy stuff depending on, so here we're using a deep neural network looking at the waveforms that are you know, recorded from you know, detecting the signals. 
And you can do very nice separations, both for you know, between only single site types of events or multiple sites. So you'd expect multiple sites when you have grams traveling from an electron in, 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 in double beta decay. So that's essentially saying how we increase our sensitivity to uh, measuring or searching for neutrinos double beta decay with the detector. Uh, here is our final result it was published uh, kind of mid last year. Uh, what I show you is the energy spectrum and the counts for phase one, phase two. These are only single sites, so essentially dominated by you no know, beta events. And so the gray area is, is all uh, beta events. You can clearly see. So this beta events is the double beta decays uh, from xenon 36. So we have a very good measurement of the half life for xenon 136 double beta decay. And then here there's an inset which is just showing the region around the Q value and how many events you have there. So saying these are all essentially uh, background. Uh, you estimate backgrounds by looking at other regions of the detector and saying, oh, if I have that much uh, signal in the other region, how much I have in my ROI. And, and, and that's what I'm showing in this table. This is our expected number of events in the ROI for phase one, phase two. They add up to 63, 64. And then when you count here, we had like a 65. So, so there's a number of fluctuations which you'd expect easily from Poisson uh, fluctuations. Um, so the final result EXO200 provides in neutrinos double beta decay search is that we set a limit or a lower limit in this half-life because you don't see any, like these two events are just uh, statistical fluctuations um, of a 3.5 times 10 to the 25 years at 90% confidence level. This is the evolution you know, of the sensitivity of EXO200 for the several analyses we, we, public, uh, we, we published and, and the, the, the corresponding data limits. Uh, I know I'm very close in time now, uh, just brief on the next generation and then end here. So Nexo is what we plan to build as a successor for EXO200. You know, since the EXO200 was very successful, uh, the idea here is you know, we need more uh, nucleus, right? We need more nuclei to search for neutrinos double beta decay. So we're increasing the size of EXO200, which is about 150 kilograms of liquid xenon to five tons of liquid xenon. The idea is the same, but it's you no, know, it's a bigger TPC without a, a say a cathode in the middle. Um, we, we expect to have even better energy resolution and the way to achieve these is just you know, this conceptual design. Uh, we are removing the central cathode Cathode, so making the inner region of the detector much uh, cleaner than EXO200. So it's a, a, almost a background free experiment running inside the very inner uh, part of the detector. Um, we improving the energy resolution, which is you know, good to, to find where the, the peak is by adding the light sensors, not at the ends, but uh, surrounding the barrel. Um, and you're making the, the pitch for uh, the beat size for the charge detection in EXO200 was nine millimeters. In, in EXO, we're looking at uh, six millimeters. The intended location is the cryopit at Snow Lab. Um, and you no, know, I guess I want to end here. We, we, we published in 2018 and in the process of updating this result. But when you try and bring all our knowledge about this detector, you know, a very realistic knowledge in terms of the you know, radioactivity of the materials we can build it, you know, the fiducial volume we can use for the analysis, the type of analysis you use. We're you know, uh, estimating after 10 years of running the detector to reach 9.2 times 10 to 27 years uh, of you know, sensitivity for, for life, uh, half life on neutrinos double beta decay. And what that means is when you look at the ordering of neutrinos, uh, uh, neutrino masses, this will cover uh, the entire. So here, what you have is uh, you know, a well-known as a lobster plot you know, of you know, what is the effective neutrino mass measuring in, in, in these experiments versus the minimal, say, neutrino mass in the normal hierarchy scenario, inverted hierarchy scenario. So what this means represents is after 10 years of running Nexo, if you don't see anything and you no know, neutrinos are major nanoparticles, we will be sort of eliminating the uh, inverted hierarchy uh, scenario. So, so, so that's where you know, all or most of the future uh, generation neutrinos double beta decay searches are, are setting their limits. Uh, so I just put this as a, a paper from another collaborators. Um, uh, just I'm gonna finish here. Uh, just saying, you no know, Nexo is around here, the 15 milli electron volts under the inverted hierarchy. And, and you no, know, the main point here is both germanium, tellurium and, and, and xenon, they, they set the same uh, sort of constraints.
by design. So, so, so that's all I wanted to say. This is the next collaboration. I won't cover the last two bits just in case uh, I, I had finished it earlier. So I'm gonna stop here and, and, and leave the conclusions on and ask if there's any questions. So sorry for going beyond a few minutes. Okay, uh, thank you, Caio. Thank you so much for the beautiful talk. So please, if you want have, I guess we have time for uh, one question, but uh, if the, audi the audience have more questions, then we can send them to Caio too, okay? So is there anyone who wants to ask a question? And see if there's any question here in Kine and at the chat. Okay, if, if there is no question, uh, well, because of the time, I, I would like to say thank you again, uh, Caio. Uh, it was great to have you here. And if we, we collect some questions, I, I am going to be to have the pleasure to send them to you. And also, I'd like to to thank you to your support here with your with our program too. Uh, Caio is supervising or co-supervising in UC, which is one of who is one of our students. So it's really really good to have you as as one of our supporters. So thank you so much, Caio. Yes, thank you. Yes. I, Okay. Okay, so now uh, I'd like to, to call the next uh, speaker, which is Rodrigo Holanda. Rodrigo? Hi. Okay, Hi. Rodrigo. Okay. Uh, Você quer é, tentar é, compartilhar sua tela, Rodrigo? Ok. Ok, estou vendo okay. bem. Estou uhum. vendo bem e te ouvindo bem também. Oh, Se great. você quiser colocar no full screen, isso, ok. I did. Beleza, ok. So, uh, I'm going to record now the presentation. Okay, so uh, uh, it's uh, really a pleasure to have here uh, a friend of our program, of our postgraduate program, and a friend of our department, Professor Rodrigo Landa. Uh, so I'd like to thank you, Rodrigo, for uh, accepting the invitation and for bringing us uh, some uh, some results of your of your research of your research group. So I'm going to make a, a brief presentation of Rodrigo. So Rodrigo is from Brazil. He made his PhD at the University of São Paulo uh, and then a postdoc at the Observatório Nacional. And now he's professor at Federal University of the Rio Grande do Norte. And uh, also he is a CNPq research fellow and uh, uh, he's also a member of our postgraduate program. And today, Rodrigo is going to talk about uh, galaxy clusters and cosmology. So please feel free to, to give your talk, Rodrigo. Thank you again. Okay, you are professor, professor, uh, professor João. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, prefer, uh, my, I prefer to do my talk uh, in Portuguese, okay? But uh, the questions uh, in English are welcome to no problem, ok? Então, eu vou agradecer novamente ao professor João pelo convite. E o título da minha palestra é Galaxy Clusters and Cosmology. Aqui eu vou falar brevemente sobre a cosmologia que pode ser efetuada ou retirada de observações de aglomerados e galáxias e fazer um pouco da propaganda do que a gente faz lá no Departamento de Física da UFRN, ok? Então, é... A estrutura está mais ou menos é, dividida dessa seguinte maneira. É, eu discuto algumas propriedades físicas tá, de aglomerados de galáxias. É, discuto é, duas observações, dois observacionais, na verdade, tá, de extrema importância em cosmologia, que é a emissão em raio-x e o efeito Sunyaev-Zeldovich, que ocorre nessas estruturas. E aí, por fim, pessoal, eu 
eu comento algumas aplicações né, que têm sido feitas tanto na literatura quanto pelo nosso grupo lá na UFRN, utilizando essas estruturas tá? é, extremamente interessantes. Aqui do, do lado direito, aqui do, da tela do computador, a gente pode ver um aglomerado de galáxias é, no visível, tá? na banda do visível, então você vê aqui as galáxias no visível, e na verdade essa, essa, esse aglomerado de galáxias, quando a gente vê em raio-x, a gente basicamente ver essa quantidade aqui, tá? Um núcleo extremamente quente é, de um plasma, tá? Extremamente quente aqui do centro emitindo muito raio-x e que vai diminuindo a temperatura até as bordas do aglomerado. Mas, mas é, você vê que quando você vê invisível, né? Quando você coloca na banda do visível, nada disso aparece e vice-versa, certo? Então, os aglomerados de galáxias, pessoal, são as maiores estruturas ligadas gravitacionalmente do universo, tá certo? possuem raios com cerca de 2 megaparsec, tá bom? massas que podem ser maiores do que 10 a 14 massas solares, e geralmente, assim, a classificação, a gente considera que nós temos um aglomerado de galáxias quando o número de galáxias é, passa de 50, tá? menos do que isso é um grupo de galáxias, por exemplo, a gente vive em um grupo local de galáxias, né? que tem em torno aí de 30 galáxias, algo do tipo, certo? Então, em, em termos assim, né, por classificação, passou de 50, já se chama de aglomerados de galáxias. Então, eu também coloquei aqui as galáxias é, no visível, tá certo? Que são essa parte aqui, essa parte amarelada e essa parte avermelhada aqui é de um plasma que a gente vai falar agora. É a mesma coisa aqui embaixo, tá? Aqui é visto pelo Chandra, tá? o satélite Chandra. Essa parte em violeta aqui é representando um plasma extremamente quente e a parte amarelada aqui são as galáxias que compõem esse aglomerado de galáxias. Então, o aglomerado de galáxias ele é composto basicamente por matéria escura, o um meio intra-aglomerado e as galáxias. Tá? A matéria escura é detectada indiretamente, né, pessoal, por lentes gravitacionais ou efeitos dinâmicos, tá? e corresponde a cerca de 80% da massa total nos aglomerados. Tá? Aí existe o meio intra-aglomerado de galáxias, ou seja, você tem a galáxia, aí você tem esse plasma aqui representado em violeta, tá? que é o meio intra-aglomerado de galáxias. É um plasma, na verdade, composto basicamente de hidrogênio ionizado, com temperaturas da ordem de 10 a 7 a 10 oitava Kelvin, certo? E uma densidade central rarefeita, né? Ela, esse gás aqui ele é rarefeito, com em torno de 10 a menos 2, 10 a menos 3 partículas por centímetro cúbico. E é esse meio aqui, pessoal, esse meio violeta aqui, tá? ou esse aqui meio avermelhado, representando aqui avermelhado, isso aqui é só representação, tá, pessoal? Não que a cor seja essa, tá? É uma emissão em raio-x dada a temperatura né, do, do plasma, tá certo? Então, é esse plasma que provoca os dois efeitos que a gente vai discutir já já, que é a emissão em raio-x, ou brilho em raio-x, e o efeito sunyaev zeldovich tá? Por fim, pessoal, quando a gente tem um aglomerado de galáxias, na verdade, o nome não deveria ser aglomerado de galáxias dentro dessa estrutura, porque as galáxias em si, a parte luminosa, corresponde a no máximo 5% da massa total, no máximo 5%, tá? E é detectada no visível, no infravermelho, no ultravioleta e por assim vai. Tá? E as principais, o principal tipo de galáxia que você encontra nos aglomerados são as galáxias elípticas. Tá? Então, é, naquele plasma que eu comentei anteriormente, é, que corresponde a cerca de 30% da massa, é, 15% da massa total, tem, dois, tem vários efeitos que ocorrem lá, tá, pessoal. Agora, dois são extremamente importantes para o nosso estudo em cosmologia. Um é a emissão em raio-x. Tá? Essa emissão em raio-x ocorre por, pelo quê? É pela em, emissão Bremistraulung, ou livre-livre. Tá? Isso é um processo radiativo chamado Bremistraulung. O que é isso? Como você tem um plasma aqui, tá? um plasma né? é, extremamente rarefeito, mas extremamente quente, energético, os elétrons, então os elétrons não estão ligados nos prótons, que é basicamente hidrogênio ionizado, é, quando os elétrons extremamente energéticos são desacelerados ou acelerados em direção ao próton, né, pelo campo colombiano, ele emite em raio-x, né, carga acelerada emite. Agora, como ele está extremamente energético, ele acaba emitindo em raio-x. Tá? Então, é esse processo básico que, é, que provoca a emissão em raio-x. Então, isso é a emissão em raio-x, tá, pessoal, a emissão bremen stagler Mas o que a gente observa, na verdade, é o brilho superficial Tá certo? que aí a parte observacional é um pouquinho mais chata, que é a contagem do número de fótons por segundo por minuto de arco ao quadrado. Tá certo? É isso que a gente observa aqui. Então, aqui está um gráfico 
tá? do brilho superficial em raio-x, que é o número da contagem de fótons em raio-x, por segundo, por minuto de arco ao quadrado daquela região que chega no telescópio. Tá? Esse telescópio geralmente tem que estar no espaço. Né? Então, aqui, pessoal, em vermelho, a linha vermelha é, uma, é um perfil teórico, né, que a gente chama de, de emissão de, 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 de raio-x, e os pontos em preto são os pontos observacionais. Tá? Uma coisa extremamente importante é que o brilho superficial em raio-x é proporcional à densidade eletrônica ao quadrado, ou seja, ele é principalmente, esse efeito principalmente ocorre no centro dos aglomerados, onde a densidade eletrônica é maior, e rapidamente cai em direção as suas partes mais externas, ok? O outro efeito é o efeito sundiaev zeldovt é, 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 proposto em 1973, tá, pessoal? Por isso que dois físicos aqui, russos. Então, esse aqui é um pouquinho mais complicado, mas dá para entender. Quando a gente tem um aglomerado de galáxias, como eu falei, a gente tem um aglomerado de galáxia e a gente tem um plasma, né? O meio intraaglomerado, que seria, vamos supor, essa esferazinha aqui, tá? Preenchida por um, um gás, um plasma extremamente energético. Tá? E aqui são as galáxias. Então, quando a gente tem a radiação cósmica de fundo, é, viajando livremente pelo espaço, se um, um, um fóton viajar livremente pelo espaço e vir por aqui até chegar no detector, né, vindo aqui até chegar no detector, ele vai chegar com energia, que é uma energia bem, é, bem tênue, né, porque o, a radiação cósmica de fundo é bem fria. Agora, se esses fótons interagirem com esse plasma, pessoal, eles sofrem efeito Compton inverso, ou seja, a, a, a radiação ganha energia Tá certo? Ganha energia dos elétrons, que são extremamente quentes. E quando você compara um fóton que não passou é, por um aglomerado de galáxia com um fóton que passou pelo aglomerado de galáxia, aí você vai ver que ocorre uma variação na temperatura da radiação cósmica de fundo. Tá? Isso é medida agora, pessoal, é extremamente tênue. É da ordem de 10 a menos 5, esse efeito aqui. Tá? Entre a temperatura de um que não passou e a temperatura que passou sobre a temperatura do que não passou. Isso aqui é da ordem de 10 a menos 5. Mas olha que interessante e que sorte. Esse efeito depende com a densidade é, só eletrônica, não depende com o quadrado da densidade. Tá certo? Esse efeito, pessoal, ele é independente do redshift do aglomerado. Esse aqui não. Tá? Se um aglomerado de galáxia, esse aqui está em Z igual a 0,25, a gente veria isso aqui. Se esse aglomerado tiver um redshift o dobro, isso aqui cai por um fator de 1 mais Z a quarta. Ou seja, se você dobrar o redshift, rapidamente a emissão em raio-x do aglomerado se apaga, você não consegue ver, ou vê muito fraco. Já o efeito sinaia zeldovt não. Ele, embora ele seja tênue, da ordem de 10 a menos 5, ele é independente de redshift. Como ele é independente de redshift, ele serve como um caçador de aglomerados de galáxias. Tá? Porque embora a gente veja essas estruturas nas figuras como algo gigantescos, né? no céu isso é um ponto, pessoal, é um ponto. Então, não é fácil você achar aglomerados de galáxias, principalmente em mais altos redshifts. Mas o efeito do neves como ele é independente de redshift, você consegue mapear o céu para caçar aglomerados de galáxias, tá certo? Então, aqui ó, eu coloquei um, um exemplo bem interessante, que é o brilho superficial em raio-x, que depende da densidade ao quadrado, e o efeito do neves né, que é a variação na temperatura da radiação cósmica de fundo, que ocorre quando os fotos da radiação cósmica de fundo interagem com o meio intraaglomerado. Tá? Esse é o efeito sunyaev zeldovt Ele só depende da densidade eletrônica, certo? E da temperatura do aglomerado e outras quantidades, mas da densidade só depende aqui. Ó. Então, por exemplo, a gente tem aqui esse aglomerado, essa parte aqui, ó, todinha, é, 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 colorida, é a emissão em raio-x desse aglomerado. E a parte do efeito sunyaev zeldovt é essa outra parte aqui. Ó. Você vê que ele se estende até regiões mais externas né, do aglomerado do que essa parte interna, porque depende quando a densidade é ao quadrado. Né? Do, jeito, do mesmo jeito que aumenta em direção ao centro, diminui é, para longe do centro. Tá certo? Aí aqui eu coloquei essas três galáxias também, aglomerados de galáxias, para você ver que interessante. Ó. Um está no redshift 0.17, o outro está em 0.54, e o outro está em 0.83. E eles possuem mais ou menos a mesma temperatura, esses, esses aglomerados aqui, tá? Então, vejam, isso aqui é o efeito sunyaev zeldovt Você vê, isso aqui é a intensidade do efeito, pessoal. Quanto mais vermelho, mais intenso. Então, vocês veem que praticamente não muda né, com redshift, tá certo? Praticamente não mudam. Agora, a emissão em raio-x, tá certo? Desse mesmo aglomerado colocado aqui para a gente comparar, 
está bem forte aqui. Agora, nesse outro aglomerado, o Sunia e o está a mesma coisa, mas quando você vai para o raio-x, já vai sumindo, e quando você vai para a rede shift 0.83, praticamente não vê nada em raio-x, tá? desse aglomerado de galáxia aqui. Aí você vê ele em Sunia e o tá? E essas linhas aqui, são o quê, pessoal? Essas linhas que eu coloco, são as regiões que têm a mesma magnitude do efeito, ou seja, todas essas regiões aqui possuem a mesma magnitude do efeito Sunia e o Tá? E a mesma coisa acontece se você tivesse isso em raio-x, tá? Essas linhas raio-x, como a gente vai ver agora. Então, beleza. beleza. Os, é, os aglomerados de galáxias né, são úteis né, para você estudar cosmologia. É, tem o efeito de neves e a emissão em raio-x. Aí a pessoa pergunta, é possível perguntar, ah, professor, mas todos os aglomerados de galáxias são úteis para estudar cosmologia? Não, nem todos. Apenas 30% dos aglomerados de galáxias são, é, é, vamos dizer, é, é a amostra ideal para você... 30% dos aglomerados de galáxias que existem, a gente pode, pode considerar como amostras ideais para se estudar cosmologia. Por quê, pessoal? Porque esses, esses aglomerados de galáxias ideais, eles têm que ser relaxados dinamicamente, certo? O que é isso, relaxado dinamicamente? Eles não estão colidindo um com o outro, não existe colisão entre galáxias, tá? As propriedades físicas desses aglomerados relaxados, eles são é, modeláveis né, facilmente. As propriedades físicas, como temperatura, densidade, entre outras coisas, são bem é, facilmente, né, entre aspas, aí, é, mas em, em, em comparação a outras, em outras é, é, observações em cosmologia, a gente pode considerar que modelar um aglomerado de galáxias, as propriedades físicas de um aglomerado de galáxias, não é algo tão difícil. Tá? Eles também possuem equilíbrio hidrostático, tá? os, os aglomerados relaxados estão em equilíbrio hidrostático, e é, a, a outra característica é que os centroides de cada, de cada região que emite, que emite igualmente raio-x ou efeito de neves é o mesmo, tá? Ou seja, você existe um centro para esses centroides aqui, que são as regiões, essas linhas, são as regiões que, pro, que possuem a mesma intensidade nos efeitos, certo? Ou seja, raio-x, ou seja, é, o efeito de neves tá certo? também não possui subestruturas emitindo em raio-x. Ou seja, você não tem aqui no aglomerado de galáxia uma região aqui emitindo tal quanto o centro. Né? Então, você não tem essa presença de subestruturas. É, as galáxias são praticamente elípticas, vermelhas, tá? com as estrelas já evoluídas passivamente, tá certo? Enfim, e principalmente, o brilho, é, o brilho superficial em raio-x, que você, a gente consegue medir, tem, é, que são aqui esses pontos vermelhos, eles são é, bem comportados, tá? Existem aglomerados chamados cooling flow clusters, né? Que são aglomerados com núcleo frio, que o brilho superficial vem em direção ao centro e quando chega lá no centro ele dá um pico bem grande. Então isso aí não, a gente, isso é possível mostrar que estão em um aglomerado relaxado, tá? Então, com esses aglomerados relaxados, é possível, pessoal, obter várias ferramentas cosmológicas. Por exemplo, é possível obter... É, usar os aglomerados de galáxias como termômetros cósmicos, é possível utilizar a fração de massa do gás, a distância de diâmetro triangular desses objetos, é, a contagem do, numérica de aglomerados de galáxias com redshift também é outro teste cosmológico. Tá? É, o efeito de neves por exemplo, é um útil traçador da matéria bariônica, matéria escura bariônica do universo. Tá? Então, é, a cosmologia com aglomerados de galáxias é bastante rica. Certo? Então, eu vou começar aqui a falar de algumas que, é, eu não vou entrar em detalhes, pessoal, porque cada uma desse aí já bastava, já era, seria um seminário à parte. Então, mas eu quero só apenas discutir, né, mostrar para vocês que existem e as, os principais resultados. Tá? Então, o efeito de neves ele serve como um termômetro cósmico. Ou seja, ele consegue medir a temperatura do universo em diferentes redshifts. E a gente, né, em cosmologia teórica, existe uma lei padrão, uma lei padrão, pessoal, é, para a evolução da radiação cósmica de fundo com o redshift, que é essa aqui. Mas isso aqui tem algumas hipóteses por trás, hipóteses por trás teóricas para se chegar a essa relação. É preciso testar, tá certo? Para ver se essa, essa relação é verdadeira ou não. Então isso é feito, é... por exemplo, se a gente tem uma criação de fotos por um decaimento do vácuo, né? Ou algum mecanismo alternativo de, de origem gravitacional quântica para produzir fótons. Essa, essa radiação cósmica de fundo, ela varia por um fator beta aqui, ó. Beta. Ela deixa de ser o padrão, onde 
o número de fótons é conservado da radiação corte de fundo e vem para uma outra quantidade, uma outra relação corrigida por um fator beta que pode levar em, que, em conta possíveis criação de fótons cosmológicos do universo. Como eu falei aqui, por algum processo de decaimento do vácuo, certo? Ou de origem gravitacional quântica. Tá certo? Então, isso aqui, na, na teoria, né, isso é possível. Então, o pessoal tem que testar. Então, o Planck, com 104 aglomerados de galáxias, eles, eles conseguiram, a, o satélite Planck, conseguiu medir né, a, a, a temperatura até redshift em torno de 1, tá certo? Usando o efeito de Neves Aldoft desses aglomerados. E eles obtiveram que o beta é em torno de 0,022, mais ou menos 0,018, né, em um sigma, tá certo? Ou seja, esse beta é compatível com a relação padrão, tá certo? Com, quando você usa é, aglomerados de galáxias para obter o valor desse beta, tá certo? Mas, obviamente, pessoal, isso aqui ainda é da ordem de 10 a menos 2, né? É necessário ainda continuar o estudo aqui para colocar cada vez limites mais fortes em beta, tá certo? E ver se a, a, a evolução da temperatura da radiação cósmica de fundo realmente vai... Né, é, com a lei padrão, tá certo? Uma outra quantidade que é extremamente utilizada é a fração de massa do gás dos aglomerados. O que é a fração de massa do gás, pessoal? Eu vou só, de forma sucinta, dizer para vocês aqui. A fração de massa do gás é a massa do gás, que é aquele, aquela, o gás que emite em raio-x e provoca o efeito sunyaev zeldovit sobre a massa total do aglomerado, tá certo? É possível mostrar, pessoal, que essa massa do gás aqui sobre a massa total ou a fração de gás, ela é proporcional à distância de diâmetro triangular do aglomerado elevada a 3,5, tá certo? Então, se você conseguir medir a fração de massa do gás em raio-x e você tiver uma cosmologia, né, ou o um modelo lambda CDM, x CDM, seja lá o que for, você pode utilizar essa relação aqui para obter vínculos cosmológicos, tá? que foi o que foi feito, né, e que foi feito já desde há 20 anos e continua sendo feito, melhorando a qualidade dos dados. Então, eu mostro aqui, por exemplo, o lambda CDM, o modelo lambda CDM, com os parâmetros livres, livres, ômega lambda e ômega m. Então, aqui, pessoal, a gente vê os limites das supernovas, vê o limite da CMB, o limite do BAL, que é as oscilações acústicas dos bairros, e a gente vê aqui os limites da fração de massa do gás. E aí vê a importância desses limites da fração de massa do gás, por quê? Porque eles são é, complementares né, aos outros testes. Né? Ele, ou seja, eles adicionam informação no seu espaço de parâmetros. Né? A mesma coisa aqui se a gente utilizar o modelo XCDM tá, para investigar o espaço de parâmetro ômegazinho, ômega M. Tá? Então está aqui a supernova, CMP em azul, está aqui o BAL e aqui novamente a fração de massa do gás. Tá? de maneira é, quase que ortogonal aqui a maioria dos, é, dos observáveis, né? Inserindo, adicionando informação sobre o universo, tá? Então, é, um dos problemas, pessoal, que um dos problemas que a gente tem aqui é que para sempre você estimar a quantidade de matéria, né? A quantidade de densidade de matéria no universo, o parâmetro de densidade de matéria, que é o ômega m, a gente sempre tem que colocar um modelo, ó, lambda CDM, XCDM e por aí vai, certo? Utilizando a fração de massa do gás em raio-x, que depende da distância através dessa quantidade aqui, tá? E aí, é, agora eu vou fazer um pouco da propaganda. É, o nosso grupo lá de, da UFRN, junto, juntamente nesse trabalho com o pessoal do Observatório Nacional, a gente propôs um método que, utilizando a fração de massa do gás, tá? de 40 é, aglomerados de galáxias, e a distância de luminosidade de 40 supernovas, né? distância de luminosidade de 40 supernovas, a gente conseguiu estimar a densidade de matéria escura do universo só utilizando observáveis, né? sem utilizar um modelo cosmológico. Certo? Sendo que é o seguinte, pessoal, na verdade, na verdade, a gente testou a relação padrão é, para a evolução da lei... É, para, a gente testou a lei de evolução da densidade de matéria escura né, com o fator de escala. A relação padrão de como a, a densidade de matéria escura evolui no universo é simplesmente fazendo y igual a zero. Tá? Então, tomando y igual a zero, a gente calculou quem era a densidade de matéria hoje. E usando o parâmetro de Hubble, a gente obteve quem era o parâmetro de densidade 
né, da matéria escura, que foi esse valor aqui, que está em torno de 2 sigma, né, de acordo com o obtido pelo Planck. Tá? Só que o Planck utiliza o um modelo cosmológico, e aqui a gente não utilizou nenhum modelo cosmológico. Então, isso foi a primeira parte desse trabalho aqui. Tá? A segunda parte do trabalho, a gente pegou, fez o seguinte, não, vamos deixar agora esse epsilonzinho solto aqui, livre, e vamos ver se esse conjunto de observações supernova, H0 e a fração de massa do gás, consegue limitar quem é esse epsilonzinho aqui. Porque, pessoal, se esse epsilonzinho aqui for diferente de zero, significa, por exemplo, que existe uma interação entre matéria escura e energia escura. Tá? E aí a gente conseguiu obter aqui, no espaço de parâmetros, né, de epsilon e a densidade é, da matéria escura hoje, a gente conseguiu obter um valor de épsilon que é compatível com zero. Né? 0,13 mais ou menos 0,235. Mas, obviamente, né, pessoal, isso aqui, o erro está ainda muito grande. Certo? Só que uh, a proposta é que foi né, é inovadora, vamos dizer assim, tá certo? Não usar nenhum modelo padrão para você testar, para você obter a quantidade de matéria escura e é, obter se a lei de evolução da matéria escura com o fator de escala é válido ou não. A gente obteve que é válida, mas o erro ainda é muito grande. Certo? Uma outra aplicação que a gente feita, fez recentemente dos aglomerados de galáxias é com relação ao parâmetro de Hubble, pessoal. O parâmetro de Hubble, ou constante de Hubble, é, é, um, é uma constante de extrema importância em cosmologia, tá? De extrema importância em cosmologia, porque entra em diversos cálculos e é uma quantidade observacional, tá certo? E você pode obter ela de. Diversas maneiras, mas a gente pode dividir essas maneiras da, da, da seguinte forma. Entre medidas locais, você obter o parâmetro de Hubble, medidas locais do universo, e ou medidas utilizando a radiação cósmica de fundo, onde você aqui precisa de um modelo cosmológico. Aqui você não precisa. Então, pessoal, dá para ver claramente que existe uma discrepância enorme entre as medidas locais, né, quando você usa técnicas locais de medir o parâmetro de Hubble, Pra, é, com as técnicas quando você usa a radiação cósmica de fundo e o um modelo cosmológico para obter o, a, a constante de Hubble. É, obviamente que isso aqui é uma crise enorme em cosmologia, porque ninguém sabe ainda como conciliar essas duas partes. Tá? Então, aqui não precisa de, de modelos cosmológicos e dá um valor mais alto para a constante de Hubble, em torno de 73. Aqui precisa de um modelo cosmológico e dá um valor em torno de 67. Tá certo? Que precisa e aqui não precisa. Tá bom, tá bom? Então, como é que a gente fez? É, a gente viu que a gente poderia utilizar a distribuição de galáxias para obter o valor da constante de Hubble. Então, a gente utilizou as oscilações acústicas dos bários, que, é um, que, que, que no fundo, pessoal, está ligado à distribuição tá, de galáxias no universo, e há também a fração de massa do gás, né, que é uma propriedade de aglomerados de galáxias, que também depende de como as galáxias estão distribuídas no universo. Então, a gente pegou essas duas quantidades e impôs limites na constante de Planck para comparar né, com os dois é, valores que a gente tem na literatura. E, interessantemente, a gente obteve isso aqui, pessoal. Ó. Aqui é o que a gente obteve para o modelo Lambda CDM Plan, né, que está em acordo com o valor do Planck e em completo desacordo com o valor do Ries, que é o valor local. Então, o nosso valor concorda com o valor o nosso valor em lambda CDM concorda com o valor do Planck, que também é obtido em lambda CDM, e discorda completamente do de Ries, tá? Quando a gente utilizou o modelo não plano, flat, né, ou, ou seja, curvatura livre, a gente obteve também uma excelente concordância tá, entre o que a gente propôs, que é essa aqui em vermelho, essa likelihood aqui em vermelho, com o que o Planck propôs, que é essa curva aqui em marrom. Tá? E completo desacordo novamente né, com os dados do Ries. E a mesma coisa se viu quando a gente utilizou, é, aqui é o flat XCDM, tá, pessoal? Não é lambda CDM, não. Ou, oh, não, desculpa, o nosso aqui é flat XCDM. Aqui é o nosso flat XCDM, que aí já deu um valor bem mais, deu um valor bem maior, mas mesmo assim só marginal, marginalmente compatível com o do RIS, e também em excelente acordo aqui com o do flat e lambda CDM da colaboração do Planck. Agora, o interessante, pessoal, aqui é que essa, aqui a gente usa a radiação cósmica de fundo, cujo é um, o redshift é altíssimo. Tá? Aqui são medidas locais, e o nosso também não são altos redshifts, vai até um redshift. Tá? Então, a gente obteve uma, uns observáveis cujo redshift é no máximo até um, e que no modelo lambda CDM também advoga um valor de H0 baixo. Tá certo? Então, está aqui todos os valores que a gente obteve. Tá? 
todos os valores bem mais baixos do que o obtido localmente por supernovas e cefeidas. Certo? Agora, o interessante aqui foi o fato de a gente ter usado distribuição de galáxias e que essa, essa quantidade só vão até o redshift em torno de 1. Tá bom? E por outro, pessoal, vou só é, passar aqui rapidamente por esse... Como a, os aglomerados também podem ser utilizados para testar física fundamental. A gente tem feito isso lá na, na, na Universidade do Rio Grande do Norte, no Departamento de Física, também estuda, estudando possíveis variações de constantes fundamentais na natureza. Mas aqui eu coloquei só essa relação aqui, tá, pessoal? Essa relação é conhecida como a distância ou como a distância de dualidade, tá? É, e em cosmologia é extremamente importante. Isso aqui é a distância de luminosidade de um objeto, aqui é a distância de diâmetro angular, o redshift, e essa relação aqui é igual a 1. O que é que essa relação está me dizendo? Está dizendo o seguinte, pessoal. Se você tiver um objeto que você consiga medir a distância dele utilizando a luz você vai obter a distância de luminosidade daquele objeto. Se você, com aquele mesmo objeto, tá? tiver um jeito de, de, de saber qual o tamanho dele angular e o tamanho dele próprio, você consegue também calcular qual a distância de diâmetro angular desse objeto. E essas distâncias, devido ao universo da expansão, são diferentes. Tá certo? De acordo com a técnica que você use para medir as distâncias, as distâncias são diferentes. Mas, se... É, o, o, a, a teoria da gravidade foi uma teoria métrica e o, ocorrer a conservação do número de fotos no universo, essa relação aqui tem que ser válida, tá certo? Essa relação é válida em todos os modelos cosmológicos, homogêneos e não homogêneos, requer apenas que a, a, a luz é, siga geodésicas nulas no espaço-tempo rimaniano. Ela é considerada, né, se foi considerada durante décadas, válida em, é, em praticamente todas as observações, mas ela deve ser testada, pessoal, porque a presença dessa, de, de, de alguma violação dessa relação é a indicação de uma nova física no espaço, né? ou erros sistemáticos fortes nas suas observações. Então, nesse trabalho, também com o pessoal do Observatório Nacional, a gente fez o seguinte, tá? Está terminando já. A gente fez o seguinte, é, a gente propôs uma violação da relação de dualidade, tá certo? em vez de ser um aqui, a gente colocou um eta de z, e esse eta de z, a gente chutou duas funções. Um eta de z dessa forma e o outro, o outro eta de z dessa forma. E, pessoal, se você utilizar observações e o seu eta zero de zero, né, esse termo todo vai embora, então o eta z dá igual a 1 um, e a relação é verificada. Isso aí o pessoal fez, fez durante muito tempo né, na literatura, mas sempre utilizando dois observáveis diferentes, tá, pessoal? É, que... Isso traz alguns problemas para o teste. Por exemplo, é, é, eu mesmo, anteriormente a esse teste, utiliz, propus um teste que você utilizava, utilizava supernovas em, e aglomerados de galáxias no mesmo redshift para testar essa relação. Mas eles estarem no mesmo redshift, isso não é o suficiente. Porque vocês podem estar no mesmo... Do, é, duas, dois objetos astronômicos podem estar no mesmo redshift e estarem a, 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 em direções opostas no céu. Então, esse tipo, de, de, esse tipo de teste não era o mais adequado. Então, até que a gente conseguiu perceber que a fração de massa do gás de um aglomerado de galáxia, ele é proporcional, a beleza, como eu falei, a dA elevado a 3 meios, mas se você viola a dualidade, aparece um eta aqui também, na medida da fração de massa do gás em raio-x. Por outro lado, pessoal, se você pega esse mesmo aglomerado de galáxia, e calcula a fração de massa do gás utilizando o Suniaev Zeldovich, certo? Não aparece o eta aqui. Ou seja, ele independe da relação de dualidade. Ou seja, pessoal, se você tiver um, um grupo, de, você tem uma amostra de aglomerados de galáxias, tá? Em que você consiga medir a fração de massa do gás desses aglomerados via raio-x e via Suniaev Zeldovich, é só você tomar a razão deles que você vai obter quem é o valor do eta aqui. Uma vez que um depende de eta e o outro não. E isso aqui vai ser de um objeto astronômico só. Tá? Duas observações diferentes, mas de um objeto astronômico só. Então, a gente fez esse teste e obteve que o eta zero é compatível né, em um sigma com zero, tá, pessoal? Compatível com zero. Né? Isso aqui foi um teste bem interessante. Mas, obviamente, a gente só tinha aqui 40 dados. Então, é, isso aqui tem que ser, o teste tem que ser refeito no futuro quando você tiver mais dados, né? porque a, o erro aqui ainda está muito grande. Tá? Mas a, a, a validade foi verificada dentro de um sigma. Certo? 
E esse teste difere pelos outros pelo fato de só usar um objeto. Então, só para concluir, eu ainda poderia passar a tarde aqui todinha falando sobre os aglomerados de galáxias, porque eu posso resumir aqui a, a importância, né? o, 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 é, o que torna os aglomerados assim, extremamente importante é que os limites no, no, no espaço de parâmetros que o, os aglomerados colocam né, quando você testa modelos são diferentes da CMB, Supernova, BAL, que eu mostrei anteriormente. Tá? E isso é importante, tá? porque você restringe mais o espaço de parâmetros. Outra importância é que o, o, o processo de formação de estruturas, né, o processo de formação de aglomerados de galáxias, desculpe, é, ele toma, no lugar, toma lugar, né, ele começa quando você está a energia escura começando a dominar o universo. Então, os aglomerados de galáxias começam a se formar ali do redshift 2 até o presente, a, a energia escura começa a dominar por aí também, ou seja, a energia escura influencia muito fortemente o processo de formação de estrutura de aglomerados de galáxias. As propriedades físicas são bem conhecidas, tá? É, o Irosita é um, é um telescópio que já está em, em operação e é esperado detectar 100 mil aglomerados de galáxias em raio-x, tá? no futuro aí próximo. Então, isso aqui vai dar um salto na cosmologia com raio-x. E, pessoal, como eu falei, eu poderia aqui ainda discutir testes de aglomerados de, de, de galáxias usando distância de diâmetro angular, o shear cósmico, é, number counts e por aí vai. Tá? Então, muito obrigado. Ok. Um... Thank you so much, Rodrigo, for this nice talk and uh, uh, with beautiful results and uh, uh, really interesting subjects. So uh, I guess we have time for one uh, quick question. Uh, but if the participants have some questions, uh, I can also send to Rodrigo. Let me see if we have some questions here in Q&A. Let the chat, YouTube. Okay, well, well, there's one question. Uh, so Diego is asking uh, how the telescope can create an image, uh, an image of a galaxy. I guess it's an image of a galaxy. If, well, uh, one tele ele está perguntando como é que o telescópio cria uma imagem. É, acredito que seja de uma galáxia. É... Sim. Rapaz, ó, isso aí, ele é o, 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 o telescópio, ele, no, no caso, em raio-x, né? Você tem que sobrepor os filtros, né? O, o telescópio, ele... Isso, essa é uma pergunta que é uma aula, mas assim, é, o telescópio, ele mede o número de fótons. Né? Então, você bota um filtro certo? na frente do seu detector. Então, eu só quero obter fótons do raio-x. Depois, eu quero obter fótons só, aí você tira, só do, do, do visível. Aí você tira aquele filtro, coloca o filtro da banda visível, por exemplo, ultravioleta, alguma coisa do tipo, e conta os fótons dali. Você conta fótons. Depois, com aquela contagem de fótons em cada filtro, é que você monta mais ou menos essas imagens aí. É de acordo com a contagem do número de fotos, porque ele não observa igual os nossos olhos, não, né? Ok, é, eu acho que ficou ótimo a explicação. Ok, é, então, assim, por causa do tempo, Rodrigo, eu vou, vou pedir para a gente encerrar, mas agradeço muito novamente aí pela sua presença e por... É, ter dado essa palestra muito interessante. Eu adoro quando esses parâmetros dão diferente do nome da é. CBG. É verdade. <risos> pois é. obrigado, obrigado de verdade, viu? Ok, tem, Olá, muito obrigado, mais. Rodrigo. Obrigado. Foi, foi um prazer. Igualmente. Ok. Uh... Ok, so uh, I'm. I'm going to call now our next speaker, who is uh, Lia Medeiros. So uh, again, thank you so much, Lia, for being here and uh, for accepting our invitation. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Uh, I'm going just to uh, ask Rodrigo to uh, unshare his, his screen. Rodrigo, se você puder desativar sua tela, por favor. Bom, eu também posso fazer isso, eu acho que... I'm trying. Ah, ok. Tudo bem. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah, I guess that now is my screen. Now I'm going to interrupt. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'm going to start the recording here. So again, uh, it's a pleasure to receive Leah Medeiros. So Leah, I'm going to briefly introduce you. Uh, so Leah uh, made her PhD at University of Santa Barbara. And uh, part of her PhD was also at Stewart Observatory at the University of Arizona. Leah is also lead uh, of the Event Horizon Telescope Gravitational Physics Inputs Working Group and uh, she's also a postdoctoral at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton University. So she's working with simulations about black holes and also uh, with tests of general relativity compared, compared with other uh, proposals for gravity. So Leah, thank you so much again. It's really a pleasure. So feel free to share your uh, your presentation with us. Can you see my screen? Yes, I see it and uh, I am listening to you very well too. Okay, great. Well, first I just wanted to thank the organizers for having invited me to, to give this talk here today. I'm very excited to, to be able to share with you guys what we've been working on um, with the Event Horizon Telescope. And um, what I'm going to be talking about today is going to be mostly focused on the testing gravity aspect of the Event Horizon Telescope. But of course, if you want to ask me uh, about other aspects of the EHT, I'm also happy to, to at least try to answer them. If they are very uh, instrumentation based, I might not be able to, but a lot of the other uh, questions about the, the experiment, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer. I was asked to give this talk at the level of a public talk so that it is accessible for any students that might be interested. But again, if you have questions um, about more of the technical details of uh, using the EHT to test gravity, please do ask me in the question and answer session as well. And before I move on from my title slide, I do want to tell you what it is that you are all staring at here. So this is the result of a GRMHD simulation that stands for General Relativistic Magneto Hydrodynamic Simulation. And what we do in those simulations is that we simulate the uh, the flow of matter around a black hole. And so we take into account how the presence of the black hole's gravitational field will affect the flow of the matter. And we also take into account the fact that that matter is going to be really, really hot. It's going to be so hot, in fact, that it will become a plasma. And because of that, we're gonna have a lot of charged particles moving around. And we also know that the black hole has a really powerful magnetic field. So we're gonna have a bunch of charged particles moving around in a magnetic field. And that is what creates the turbulence that you're seeing in these images here, is the interaction between the charged particles and the magnetic field. So we simulate the flow uh, of the plasma. And then after that, we have to ask ourselves, what would be happening to light, right? So as astronomers, we only observe light. We can't actually go to the black hole to see what's going on. So what would, happening to, what would be happening to light in this really crazy environment? And so we simulate what the plasma would be emitting, what wavelength it might be emitting at, and um, also simulate the path of uh, photons through this really curved space-time of the black hole. And so we're, you're going to be seeing a, a lot of these kinds of simulations throughout my talk. So since this is a public talk, I'm going to be starting at the beginning. Um, and before talking about black holes, we of course need to talk about general relativity, which is Einstein's theory of gravity. And so according to Einstein's theory of gravity, um, gravity is actually not a force, but rather a uh, geometric effect. And we are all used to living in three dimensions in space, but we also are moving through time. So uh, general relativity really requires that we treat both space and time as two parts of the same thing. And so we need to treat it as a four-dimensional space. And what general relativity tells us 
is that mass will actually curve or warp this four-dimensional space. And it's the curvature of the, uh, of the space time itself that causes the matter to move in, uh, in patterns such as the orbits of the planets around the sun. So I obviously can't draw in four dimensions, but I have a very overly simplified uh, depiction of space time here on the right. It's just in two dimensions right now, it's flat and we're gonna add in a mass uh, into this flat space time, we're going to see how that mass warps the space time. And if you were to imagine a planet moving around the space time, the planet would be trying to move in a straight line, but would be unable to move in a straight line because it would have to move through the curved space time um, due to this massive object here. And so the analogy that I always like to use in public talks is if you imagine um, yourself trying to move in a straight line, you are constrained to move uh, on the surface of the Earth. And the surface of the Earth is, uh, is a curved surface because you are on the surface of a sphere, of course. And so even if you try to move in a straight line, you will be unable to because you are constrained to move on the surface that is itself curved. And so the same thing is happening with planets. Planets are trying to move in a straight line, but they're unable to because of the curvature of the space that they have to move through. And so what's really interesting about general relativity is how it affects light. So according to Newtonian physics, light would not be affected by uh, gravity because light does not have a mass. However, according to general relativity, light will be affected by gravity because light is also constrained to move through a curved space time. So I have added here these uh, red lines. These are photons or light rays. And we're going to see how these photons or light rays, uh, how their path will be affected by the presence of a black hole. So some of these photons will fall into the black hole, other photons will escape to infinity, but will still be uh, a bit, have their trajectory uh, affected by the presence of this black hole. And so the fact that one of these theories predicts that, uh, that light will, will be affected by gravity and the other theory predicts that light will not be affected by gravity, that can be used to test which of these two theories is correct. In the first, um, Sorry, I want to explain to you the, the first time that we were able to, to test that. So if you focus first on the diagram here um, on the bottom left, we are here on Earth. This is the sun. This is obviously not to scale, but here we're going to be watching or observing this star. Okay, and we're going to map the location of this star relative to these other more distant stars with really high precision. And then we're going to wait six months. So now this Earth is on the other side of the sun, and we're going to try to do the same thing. We're going to observe the location of this star relative to these other stars. What happens, though, is that now, because the Earth is on the opposite side of the sun, light from this star is going to have to move very close to the sun, and specifically is going to move through the curved region uh, very close to the sun. And so the path of light from the star is going to have a curve in it, where it's going to be deformed or warped. And because of that, here on Earth, we're going to think that the star is actually located over here, because we always assume that light has moved in the straight line, right? So we think that the star is over here. And so if we compare these two observations six months apart, it appears as if the star has moved relative to other background stars. Um, and this uh, on the right here is just another diagram showing the exact same thing. Here's the actual position of the star. Here's the apparent position of the star. This yellow curve is the actual path of the light. And this gray line here is the apparent path of the light. And so this was done for the first time um, over 100 years ago. And uh, this was done um, in Brazil, actually. So uh, the city is called Sobrao. It's in the state of Sara. And um, just a little over 100 years ago, uh, this image was, was taken from, from that location. And so this is one of the, the original images from, from that observation. And the first thing you'll notice, of course, is that you can't see the sun. That's a really important aspect of this experiment. We need to wait for a total solar eclipse to be able to make this observation. Otherwise, the light from the sun will completely um, overwhelm the light of the small stars that are contained in these white circles here. I know it can be hard to see them, but remember, this, this picture is over 100 years old. Um, and so a few months after the observation, the results were, were published. And this is the front page of the, I do apologize for, for that notification uh, sound. 
This is the front page of the New York Times and it says, uh, lights all skew in the heavens, Einstein theory triumphs. And that's what made Einstein so famous. And so you might be wondering, why are we still testing general relativity after a hundred years? I just told you that um, we tested it for the first time in 1919, and we've been testing it uh, fairly frequently since then, right? So we've been testing this theory for 100 years. Why are we still trying to test the same theory? So there's a few different reasons for this. And again, if you want more details, please, um, more, more details on the technical side, please do ask me at the end of my talk. Um, but one of the reasons why we continue to do these tests is that when I say that I am testing gravity, there's really a lot of different aspects of the theory of gravity that one could test, right? So if you think about it, there's a lot of different predictions that a theory of gravity can make, and you can test each of those predictions, for example. The other aspect um, that is important to keep in mind when talking about tests of gravity is that it's always really important to test gravity in different regimes or different areas of the parameter space. And what I mean by that is that when we're testing gravity, we want to test gravity where it's really strong, where it's really weak, and where it's kind of a medium strength. And so the example that I showed you uh, just a couple slides ago was um, a test of gravity in the medium regime, where we're dealing with tests in the solar system. Um, it's also possible to do tests on the cosmological scale. So if you're uh, a member of the public and you're not uh, aware of cosmology. Cosmology is really just a study of the universe as a whole. So we're looking at a, the universe on a really, really large scale. And when you're looking at the universe at such a large scale, what happens is that um, all of the small perturbations from, from galaxies and planets and black holes, they're all really, really small when you're looking at a big enough scale. And so what that means is that when you look at a really big scale, the universe is pretty much flat. We say that it's at the extreme limit of really weak curvature or really weak gravity. And it's only recently that we've been able to start testing gravity at the really extremely strong regime. And this is something that when I first uh, started working on my PhD, I really wanted to use astrophysical black holes to test gravity. And that was really just a dream at the time. It was not something that we had been able to actually do. But uh, during my PhD, I was really excited to, to see not only did we detect uh, gravitational waves, which offered a wonderful test of gravity using astrophysical black holes, but now we've also seen an image of a black hole that, as I will show you, also offers us a really great way to test uh, gravity for uh, astrophysical black holes as well. And so now that we've talked a bit about the background of what general relativity is and why we want to test it, we also need to get through some of the basics of what a black hole is. Again, since, since I was asked to make this accessible for, for all. So the way that I like to define a black hole is that a black hole is just a region of space time where the curvature is so extreme that not even light can escape. Really nothing can escape, not light, not information, nothing. And you might be wondering, okay, what is it about a black hole that makes it so incredibly, um, uh, makes the gravitational field and specifically the curvature so incredibly strong. What makes black holes so uh, incredibly strong is the density. So that's really what makes them special is that you need really incredibly intense density to be able to create extreme gravity. And you might be wondering, okay, what do I really mean by incredibly dense, right? What density would you really need? Well, as an example, if you were to take the entire earth and you wanted to make a black hole out of the entire Earth, you'd have to take the entire Earth and squeeze it down so that it was about the size of a marble. And it would look something like this. So obviously, us humans will never be able to do that. But this is something that the universe uh, can do with, with, with um, a significant frequency, actually. And it's really not that difficult for the universe to, to create such extreme uh, densities. And so we've known about black holes for a while. Um, but it's really recently that we've been able to really use them to, to do these kinds of uh, really precise tests of general relativity. So I, a couple more things uh, as far as terminology goes that I wanted to get out of the way here. I do wanna define the event horizon. So the size of the little tiny earth that you see here, that's really the size of the event horizon that the tiny black hole uh, would have if you were to make the earth into a black hole. And so, Given my definition, um, you can think of the event horizon as the boundary between the inside and outside of the black hole. 
Um, however, it's really important to keep in mind that the event horizon is not actually a surface. If you were to cross the event horizon, you probably wouldn't even notice. And it's not something that you would be able to see either, which will become important later on. And I also did want to uh, also define singularity. So if the event horizon is not a surface, right, where is all the matter that you use to make your black hole? Well, it's all going to be contained in a volume at the center of the black hole that's infinitesimally small, OK? So you're going to have all of your matter in an infinitesimally small space, and that's going to be called a singularity. And so there is another reason why uh, using black holes to test general relativity is so exciting and so uh, interesting. And that has to do with um, not only the theory of general relativity, but also the theory of quantum mechanics. And obviously, I'm not going to explain all of quantum mechanics uh, in my talk today. But for the purposes of this talk, the only thing you need to know is that quantum mechanics uh, uh, explains the behavior of really small things. OK, so if you have something that's really small, you're going to need to use quantum mechanics to explain it. And so there's a lot of uh, really active, really exciting research that's being done on how to put these two theories together. OK, so there's a lot that we still don't understand about what happens when these two theories interact with each other. And one of the reasons why there's still a lot we don't understand is that it's really hard to actually test how these two theories interact with each other. Because to test this, you're gonna need either a object or an experiment or a phenomenon that really does require um, both of these theories to explain that experiment. And so a black hole is really the perfect experiment for this or the per perfect laboratory for this. Um, because we already know that we're at the very extreme end of the gravity um, of general relativity, where we have really intense gravity. So we know that we're going to need to use general relativity to explain black holes. But in addition to that, we've also learned that all of the matter is contained in a point that's infinitesimally small. So we're also going to be at the limit of really small things, right? So we're definitely going to need to use quantum mechanics to explain it as well. And so a black hole really is almost by definition the, the perfect laboratory for us to test how these two theories interact, but also just to test uh, general relativity itself at the very extreme limit. So if you imagine uh, what the perfect laboratory would look like, you're probably thinking of a room with a lot of really expensive equipment. However, my perfect laboratory just has a black hole and nothing else because as I've mentioned, we can't create a black hole here on Earth, but also we really don't want to create a black hole here on Earth. And not only that, but we have the added complication that my perfect laboratory is about 55 million light years away. Specifically, the black hole in the image from the EHT that you uh, uh, saw in April of 2019, that black hole is in the center of the galaxy M87, and that galaxy is 55 million light years away. So I obviously can't send any sort of equipment or instruments implementation to perform tests on my black hole either. So what we do is um, essentially what I would consider the next best thing, which is we're going to try to um, observe the gravitational effects of the black hole. And before we get into the details of this, I wanted to uh, give you another example of uh, another experiment that did that. That's been an experiment that's been uh, in the news recently because it just won the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics. So the uh, image that you see here on the right, these colorful blobs, these are stars, these are real stars that exist at the center of our galaxy. The number here in 1995, these are years. And as I play this animation, you'll see that this data was taken over um, about a decade or so. And this experiment has continued, so it's been over two decades now. And what you're seeing is how these stars are, are orbiting a massive object that is contained at the center here. And so, oh, sorry, I'm gonna drink some water. Sorry about that. Um, so anyway, so they're all orbiting a massive object at the center of this image. And what these um, the researchers in this project did was use the orbits of these stars to measure the total mass contained in the central region. And that was really the first proof that so there is a supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy, has a mass of about 4 million times the mass of the sun. 
And, um, and as I mentioned, so this particular project is uh, from a group at UCLA led by Andrea Gez. And um, there's also a, a second group that's doing a similar project led by uh, Reinhard Genzel. And both Andrea and Mike Reinhard just won the Nobel Prize um, a couple months ago um, for the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics. And so they are using the gravitational effects of black holes to learn more about black holes themselves. And we're going to be doing the same thing, but we're actually going to be using light. So it's a bit of an analogy to that very first experiment that I was talking about, where we used the deflection of light caused by the sun to learn more about general relativity and to test general relativity. We're going to be doing the same thing. We're going to be using the fact that black holes are going to affect the trajectory of light to learn more about the black hole itself. And so the first time that anybody uh, tried to calculate what you would see if you were to look at a black hole was in the 1970s. And um, the image that I'm showing you here, this figure is actually from one of those original papers. And what they calculated is what you would see if you were to look at a black hole that was being illuminated by a really large flashlight. And what they found is that you would see a really bright ring that would encircle a dark region. That dark region is what we now call the black hole shadow. Another way to, to think about this is that the dark region can also, uh, so the black hole shadow is the shadow that the black hole casts on the surrounding emission. And that's really important to just keep in mind that the emission that we are seeing is not from the black hole itself, but it's emission from all of that matter that's swirling around the black hole. And we're essentially just noticing that there's a region of the image that has some missing light, okay? And so since the 1970s, we've made a lot of progress in uh, trying to calculate what the image of a black hole might look like. So instead of using a flashlight, um, we're using uh, actual simulations of matter swirling around black holes, um, trying to take into account as much real physics as we can. So this is a similar simulation to what I showed you on my title slide. But in this simulation, um, blue it corresponds to a mission that has a wavelength of 1.3 millimeters. Green corresponds to a mission that has a wavelength of 0.87 millimeters and red has a wavelength of 0.3 millimeters. And it's important to keep in mind that um, 1.3 millimeters is the wavelength that the EHT observes at. And what I wanted to emphasize on this particular simulation is that hopefully you can see that there's this uh, very thin white ring that remains perfectly constant while everything else varies around it. And I'm gonna highlight that with this dashed black circle here. That is the edge of the black hole shadow. Now, according to general relativity, there is a very precise geometry that a black hole should have. If the black hole uh, has a geometry that is different from what is predicted by general relativity, we will know that there is a lot of really crazy fun physics that we do not understand yet, and we're going to have to go back to the drawing board and um, come up with some new theories to explain that. And so what's really interesting is that um, if the black hole is consistent with the predictions of general relativity, the edge of the black hole shadow has to be very close to a circle. Okay, it's very hard for you to create something that's not a circle. Um, and not only that, but the size of the black hole shadow will only depend on the mass of the black hole and the distance between you and the black hole. What that means, and specifically what the actual experiment we are doing with the EHT is, is that if you take an image of a black hole um, where you know the mass and you know the distance, then you can measure the black hole shadow in your image, measure this bright ring of emission, and you can see whether or not the image that you measure is consistent with what was predicted by general relativity or not. Okay, so that is the experiment that we're going to be performing with the EHD, or specifically that we have already performed with the EHD, but we will continue to, to improve upon in the years to come. And so, um, since I know obviously that there are a lot of physicists in the audience as well, I do wanna give you a little bit more of the technical details of what the black hole shadow actually is. So this is again a simulation, but it's much more um, scientific and less, uh, less aesthetically pleasing, I guess. Um, so this green circle here, this is the event horizon. You're gonna have a black hole in the center of this image. This dashed line is the photon orbit. And all of these red and blue lines here, these are photons or light rays. And we're gonna see how the trajectory of these photons is going to be affected by the, the presence of this black hole. And what you will see is that all of the blue photons are going to fall into the black hole, all of the red photons 
photons will escape to infinity. And it's really these blue photons that create the black hole shadow. So there's a couple of things to keep in mind here. First is the fact that the black hole shadow is about two and a half times bigger than the event horizon. That's really important. So if you remember the image of M87 that the EHT published, the dark region in that image is not the event horizon. We do not see the event horizon in the image. Um, it's actually not an observable feature at all. And specifically, um, you can create uh, different black hole models that are different from the predictions of general relativity that could be consistent with our image that don't even have an event horizon. So the image doesn't even prove that this object has an event horizon. So we are not seeing the event horizon. Very, very important to keep that in mind. One way for you to think about what the black hole shadow is, is that it's essentially an impact parameter, right? So we can define um, essentially the critical curve between, black, between photons that fall into the black hole, photons that escape. And we're really trying to measure the size and the shape of that critical curve, or in other words, the impact parameter here. Another way to think about it, if you follow the trajectory of this, um, of the, the blue photon that's at the very edge here, if you follow that trajectory, what you'll see is that at the back here, it's um, essentially tangent to the photon orbit. And that's also really important. So the edge of the black hole shadow is also equivalent to the lensed photon orbit. And that's another way to define the black hole shadow as well. And mathematically, either of these definitions is, will give you the exact same result. And again, just to keep, for you to keep in mind, the observer in this case would be off to the right at infinity. Uh, and I'm putting a telescope there to, to signal this. And so now that we've talked about what the black hole shadow actually is, we also need to talk about what uh, observation conditions are necessary for you to be able to observe this, right? So first, you need to have enough light so that light your black hole is actually illuminated. Otherwise, you just won't observe anything. Second, you need the emission to originate close enough to the black hole so that it will be strongly gravitationally lensed around the black hole but it still needs to be far enough away that it's not just all going to fall into the black hole. Okay, so there's kind of a sweet spot where we want the peak of our emission to be. And finally, you also need the surrounding plasma to be sufficiently transparent at the observed wavelength. And so that's also really important. And so what we did with the EHT was we ran a lot of simulations beforehand, before creating this, this, uh, this telescope, where we tried to find the best possible wavelength for us to observe at that would satisfy these three bullet points, okay? So you need to have, your object needs to be bright enough at that wavelength, um, the wavelength needs to, to be emitted close enough to the black hole, and the rest of the stuff around your black hole has to be transparent at that wavelength. And so the background of this uh, slide here is again, a result of a simulation. You've probably seen by now that I work a lot with simulations. And, um, these yellow uh, features here, these are the jets of the black hole. Again, if you want more details about that, please do ask me, but I don't have time to, to get into the details of that now. Um, and this orange structure here, this is this really big poofy uh, accretion disk for this uh, big supermassive black hole. Now we are viewing this black hole at one centimeter wavelength. And if the EHT observed at one centimeter wavelength, we would be able to learn more about the jets of the black hole, and we would be able to learn more about the actual uh, accretion flow, but we would not be able to test general relativity because we cannot see the black hole shadow because it's being blocked by this big poofy accretion flow. So this is actually an animation, and I'm going to go from one centimeter all the way down to 1.3 millimeters, and we're going to see how the opacity of this accretion flow is going to be uh, changing as a function of wavelength. So I'm going to go ahead and play that. So you can see how you get to shorter millimeter wavelengths. Um, you end up creating, uh, making your entire accretion disk uh, transparent. And I've also zoomed in here. And the, the sharp edge that you see here that's, that's constant, this is the edge of the black hole shadow. OK? So a lot of my talk is very much focused on just the testing gravity aspect of this uh, telescope. And I just wanted to take just a couple moments to, to highlight um, that this is in fact a really, really large collaboration with a lot of people that are um, working on several different aspects. And so I'm gonna take you guys on a tour of all of the telescopes that participated in the 2017 observations. And those were the observations that were used to um, create the image 
that you saw in 2019, okay? So obviously there's a lot of people that work on all of these telescopes. This really is a, a really international collaboration and we have over 300 or so people. And what's really exciting is that we're always working on um, the next best thing. We're always trying to improve our instrumentation as well. And so these were the telescopes that participated in the 2017 observations. And um, we are hoping to observe in 2021 as well. Obviously uh, we value the health and safety of our uh, telescope personnel a lot. And so we will be prioritizing safety um, and we might not be able to observe due to the pandemic. Uh, our observations in 2020 got canceled because of the pandemic, but if the pandemic allows, um, we will observe in 2021. And what's really exciting is that we're gonna be adding three new telescopes to this array as well. So in 2017, we had telescopes at six different locations. And if all goes well, in 2021, we'll have telescopes at nine different locations, which will be a really exciting uh, and important advancement in, in, in our work as well. So this is the image that you have all seen already. This is the image of the black hole in the center of the M87. And the first thing we can do with this image is we can measure the, uh, the size of the black hole shadow. And if you want to know more details about how we actually go from the image to these measurements again, please do ask me at the end. Um, I had to make some difficult choices in, in putting this talk together and had to cut out a lot of interesting stuff. So first thing we can say is that the size of the black hole shadow is in fact cons consistent with the predictions of general relativity. And this is the main result um, as far as testing GR is concerned that was contained in those first publications from April of 2019. And then um, in a publication that came out just a couple months ago, we tried to go a step further than that, right? So the idea here is um, what we did in the first step was we measured the size and we said that it was consistent. And specifically we said that um, the size of the black hole shadow could be different um, up to 17% from the predictions of general relativity and still be consistent with our um, observations. However, we had no idea how we were going to relate the 17% constraint on shadow size to any actual constraints on the theory itself, right? So it's really difficult to go from um, a constraint on the shadow size to an actual constraint on the four dimensional geometry of the black hole. And so that's what I've been uh, working on, uh, at least in part in the last uh, year or two, is um, trying to figure out how we're going to connect this constraint on the shadow size to a real constraint on the geometry of the black hole itself. So um, I have an animation where um, the size of black hole shadow will change slightly and that will show you kind of the bounds that we have on shadow size. And now we're gonna essentially ask ourselves how much um, room do we still have or in other words, how different from um, general relativity could a theory be and still be consistent with our observations? So one of the things that I've been working on um, during the last year is running about 24,000 different simulations. And in each of these simulations, what I do is I take the black hole that is the predicted black hole by general relativity and I add a different modification to it, okay? So there are many different kinds of modifications that I've tried to, to add to these black holes. And for each modification, I have a parameter that determines the strength of that particular modification. So in these two animations here, these are just two examples, these blue circle or circle um, like uh, shapes. These are the edges of the black hole shadows for these black holes. And what I'm doing in each of these two animations is I'm just changing the the amplitude of one particular parameter that, uh, that determines the, this, the importance of a particular modification, okay? So on the right side, I am increasing a modification that specifically affects the overall size of the black hole shadow. And on the left, I'm increasing a modification that affects the shape of the black hole shadow. Okay, and so if you're interested, um, you can go to my website, it's at the bottom here, and I have an interactive plot at the bottom where you can change these parameters yourself and see how changing these different parameters uh, can affect the size and the shape of the black hole shadow. And if you're interested, I also have some links to, to different talks. If you wanted to, to hear a talk similar to this one, but in Portuguese, I have a link to that as well. And so with these 24,000 uh, simulations, I was then able to compare these different sim simulations to um, the, the observations that we have of the EHT. And this is just trying to show you that. So this solid line here, this is the, um, the prediction 
by general relativity, and these dashed lines are the error bound bounds from the EHT. And I'm just changing one particular modification here. And so these green and red circles, these are results from real simulations. And I'm just showing you that the green ones are within our error bounds and the red ones are ruled out. And so we were really excited that we were actually able to place constraints on the geometry of um, the black hole itself. And again, keep in mind that this is a four dimensional geometry um, that we're really dealing with here. And so this was already excited, exciting for this paper again that just came out a couple of months ago, but we wanted to go one step further than that again. And so what we wanted was to be able to compare the constraints that we get with this black hole to um, constraints that have been done in, in different ways, right? So there have been a lot of solar system constraints, for example. And so in the beginning of my talk, I talked about how there are different aspects of the theory of gravity that you can test. And we were able to uh, derive what aspect of the theory really controls the size of the black hole shadow. And we found that the, the aspect of the theory that controls the size of the black hole shadow is the same part that is uh, tested using the precession of Mercury's orbit around the sun, for example. It's the, the, the part of the theory that really controls the slowing down of clocks, for example. And so we were able to compare our constraint on this aspect of the theory to the constraints on the same aspect derived from the precession of Mercury's orbit. And what we found is that our constraints are about 500 times stronger or more restrictive than the constraints from uh, Mercury's orbit around the sun in the solar system. And so in addition to that, we also wanted to compare our constraints to the constraints from gravitational wave detections, for example. Now, um, obviously there's uh, significant differences in the ways that we test gravity versus the ways that gravitational waves test gravity. For example, we are not dealing with dynamical metrics. They are dealing with dynamical metrics. There are some you know, kind of pros and cons to either, um, to either approach. But taking all of that into account, what I can say is that our two approaches are complementary to each other. Not only are we looking uh, testing the theory in different ways, but we're also looking at uh, black holes that have very different sizes. So the black holes that the EHT can observe have um, either a million to a billion solar masses, um, whereas the black holes that LIGO and Fergo can observe will have on the order of just a few times the mass of the sun. So we're looking at very different regions of the parameter space, so they are complementary. But what we found is that the constraints we have um, from the EHT are actually comparable to the constraints from gravitational waves, which was again, very exciting for us. And so in summary, um, black holes offer us an unprecedented opportunity to test the theory of gravity. Um, I always like to say that we are in the dawn of a new era where we can finally really do uh, gravitational astrophysics uh, or black hole astrophysics where we can really test gravity uh, using astrophysical sources, which is very exciting. And of course, I, I know that um, that we've been doing that with cosmology for a while, but I mean in the uh, uh, strong field regime. And um, the image of M87 that was published by the EHT um, can already be used to measure the size of the black hole shadow and determine how much wiggle room we still have. And I've been running tens of thousands of simulations of how different modifications to the black hole geometry itself would affect the size and the shape of the black hole shadow. And we were able to use those simulations together with the measurements from the image of M87 to constrain what kinds of modifications are still allowed. And um, we were able to also compare our uh, constraints with constraints uh, that were done in the solar system, for example, and found that our constraints are about 500 times stronger than what can be done in the solar system and are comparable to gravitational wave constraints. And so with that, um, I think I should still have quite a bit of time left. And I, I did that on purpose because I wanted to have enough time for, for a good discussion. Um, and again, if you wanted more details, more specifically more technical details, I have a lot of extra slides that I'm more than happy to, to show and, and talk about um, that would be more technical as well. So I'm trying my best to kind of uh, be approachable to all, but also still have the technical details if, if you're interested in that. So with that, thank you. And thank you so much for your attention. Okay. Uh, thank you again, Leah, uh, for this beautiful presentation and uh, for the excellent uh, 
and didactic way that you made the presentation. Uh, so we have time for questions. So please, if you have some questions, uh, you can type them then here in, in the Q&A. Okay, you have one question here. Uh, I'm going to read it. I have a curiosity regarding the first photo of, a, of the black hole. Is it expected that all have the same shape in general, the shape of the, back of the black holes depends on what? Good question. Okay, so, so I'm gonna answer that in a couple of different ways. So, um, so there are two different things that we need to keep in mind here, right? So one is the black hole shadow itself. And one thing that I kind of glossed over in my presentation today is the fact that black holes in space are probably spinning. And so we obviously need to take into account spin. And if you're taking into account spin, you also lose the spherical sy symmetry. So then you also have to take into account the inclination angle between your observer and your spin axis of your black hole. And so um, those two things do matter. It's just that at the level that the EHT is at right now, um, we, and the small deviations that you get from increasing spin and changing the inclination angle are below the error bounds that we would have for the EHT. So at least right now, I can safely say that, um, that spin does not affect what we are doing as far as the size and the shape of the black hole shadow. Because again, it, the, 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 the changes in the size are between about 5.2 and 4.8 GM over C squared. So that's a range of only about 4%. And so the EHT error bound is 17%, right? So there's no hope of us uh, being affected by spin, at least right now. However, there is um, a different aspect to your question, which is more on the image itself, right? So one aspect is the black hole shadow and the size and shape of the black hole shadow. The other aspect is the actual image. And that obviously will um, be affected by a lot of astrophysical things as well. So one thing um, that's really special about M87 is that the inclination angle of, um, of, so, okay, so for M87, we see a really large scale jet at longer radio wavelengths. Now, there is no way for us to, at least right now, really definitively prove that the spin axis of the black hole is aligned with that large scale jet, but it's a pretty good guess that it probably is. And so a lot of our work has been assuming that those are aligned. If they are aligned, what that means is that we're looking at this black hole almost face on. It's only 17 degrees off of um, our line of sight. And so if we're looking at something face on, we expect that the, uh, that the ring that we see would be fairly symmetric. Now, the image is not completely symmetric, but, um, but the level of asymmetry that we see is consistent with having um, something that is almost face on. Changing different aspects of these, uh, of these models, we can create um, something that is not face on, but is still fairly symmetric and, and so forth. And that's actually one of the things that I'm exploring in my work right now. Um, but my point is just that there is some freedom that uh, the Sajay star, for example, the, the black hole in the center of our galaxy, which is a black hole that we also observe, there is some possibility that for Sajay star, we'll only be able to see half of a circle and we just won't be able to complete the circle. Oh, wow. That's definitely possible um, if that black hole is edge on, for example, and depending on what's happening with the magnetic field of the black hole, if the magnetic field is really strong, um, we might still see, kind of see the full ring, but if the magnetic field is not so strong, we'll probably only see half of the ring. Um, so anyway, so there is some flexibility there, um, but, but as far as the actual black hole shadow, um, is concerned there's not too much flexibility. Sorry, that was very long-winded, but that was a really good question. Okay, thank you, Leah. Uh, we have another question here at the chat. Uh, it's about uh, these constraints over uh, several tiers of gravity. If uh, such constraints can rule it out some tiers that, well, are quite in good agreement with inflation, for instance, like F of T gravity or yeah, F of R gravity or something like this. Okay, yes, I see the, the question in the chats here. here. So, so great, that is a very good question. And, um, and I'm, I'm unfortunately gonna have to give that kind of a long-winded winded, uh, response as well. So in my more technical talks, I start by, by kind of getting at uh, this question. So 
when we're talking about testing gravity, when you specifically when you compare what the EHT is doing to what LIGO is doing, for example, I would put um, test gravity kind of in two different categories. One category, we're looking at dynamical metrics. And so we actually have to take into account all of the dynamics of the theory itself. The other one, we're just looking at a static metric of a black hole. So the EHT, we are just looking essentially at a static black hole or stationary black hole in vacuum because it, it, we do allow for spin. So, so it's stationary, not static, but, but it's essentially in vacuum because the mass that's going around the black hole is so, so small compared to the mass of the black hole itself that we assume that it's negligible and, and kind of ignore it um, as far as a uh, dynamical metric is concerned. And so we are testing uh, in a way, a different aspect of the theory than what LIGO and Virgo are doing, because they are also, in addition to testing the actual metric of the black hole, they're also testing the dynamics of the theory. So a lot of the theories that you are bringing up, they affect the dynamics of the theory, but they actually don't affect the metric of the black hole itself for a, some kind of long-winded mathematical reasons that we can get into if, if you really want. Um, there are reasons why a lot of these modified gravity theories still predict a Kerr black hole. And so because of that, it's actually really hard for the EHT to rule out several of those theories. And um, the kind of the opposite side of that is that it's really hard to make a theory that doesn't predict Kerr, which is why what I've been doing with these simulations is a very um, kind of parametric way to go about this. And I'm trying to be agnostic to the underlying dynamics of the theory, right? So I'm just looking at black holes as just simple geometry, and I'm not uh, restricting myself to particular known black hole solutions that are consistent with any of these particular theories, right? So you, there are kind of pros and cons to this. Um, I would argue that I am doing a metric test and I'm testing the no-hair theorem in a way that is not going to be affected by any of the messy di dynamical problems, right? So in a way, it's a cleaner metric test. But I'm also limited by the fact that I can't really constrain a lot of these other theories that are really interesting, um, but still predict a curve black hole. So hopefully that answered your question. Um, but yeah, but please put anything else in the chat if, if, um, if that wasn't clear. Okay, Fisher. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, do you have more questions? Uh, se vocês quiserem fazer questões em português também, podem fazer. Se vocês quiserem falar também aqui, é, algum participante quiser falar, eu posso permitir também, é, é, basta levantar as mãos. Okay, I, I have a question, Leah, uh, about that uh, animation that you put it in the beginning and in the end of the presentation. Uh, because it seems, well, I, I don't know if it, it was my eyes, because I am a little bit blind, but <laughs> I don't know if it was my eyes, but uh, it seems to me that uh, that disk of accretion is uh, turning uh, in, uh, in clock, Plot, uh, sorry, it's turning in a way, and then it it change its its way of turning its uh, its direction of spinning uh, uh, when you when when the moving is passing, or it, it's always have the same spinning direction. Uh, um, it always has the same spinning direction, and it's always going clockwise. But it okay. might be a problem with the transmission over Zoom. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I I thought that it was a effect about the gravitational field or something like this. But okay. No, no, my my accretion flow and my black hole continue to spin in the same direction, then they are aligned with each other. In that okay. Mais alguma questão, pessoal? Any question? Yeah. John, there is one, one question in a... Oh, okay. Thank you, Marcelo. Uh, Amico is asking, do you have simulation of the shadows of the black hole collisions? Oh, that's a really good question. Okay. 
So the simple answer is no, but that's really, really hard to do. And that's something that I'm really interested in. So I've been working a lot with a, uh, okay, so let me take a step back. So a lot of the simulations I've been showing you are simulations that have essentially two steps. So one is the GRMHD part where you're simulating the flow of matter around the black hole. And the other part is what I can call radiative transfer and ray tracing, which is when I'm doing all of the calculations for what this matter would be emitting and how the light would move around in your, um, in your crazy geometry that you created. So I work mostly with the radiative transfer and ray tracing part. And so I work almost entirely just dealing with light and not really dealing with the matter itself in my simulations. But then I obviously, I have collaborators work on the other part, we put them together, we collaborate and work on uh, all of the aspects of it. So I've been working with a, a code that, um, that was developed in the group where, where I did my PhD and it's a code that runs on GPUs. So it's very, very fast. And one of the things that I'm interested in doing is making that code compatible with some of the other codes that are working on collisions. So there's, there's a few complications here though, is that it's much easier for, for you to create a code that can handle, for example, two supermassive black holes um, in orbit around each other. And, you know, they're not really colliding yet, but they're kind of in orbit and it could be a really interesting um, problem already. That'll be a much easier problem than actually simulating um, the collision itself. But I think that that's something that, you know, might be a few years off, but it would be something I'd definitely be interested in. But, but I think that we'd have to potentially still solve a lot of new physics problems to actually get the numerics of that to work. Because I'm sure you're going to create all kinds of crazy numerical problems uh, trying to solve that when you're when you throw photons at, at two black holes colliding, it, it can get quite messy. Is there any more questions? Oh, I guess we have one more here. And what about the, and what are about just dynamically or uh, continuously increasing the mass of the black hole? What happens to the shadows? Okay, so the, the shadow is linearly related to mass. And so, um, so the size of the black hole shadow for a short child black hole that's not spinning is equal to the square root of 27 times g m over c squared. So g and c squared are just constants, m is the mass of the black hole. So it's just linearly related to mass. So if you increase the mass, you will just, if you increase the mass by a factor of two, your shadow will, will grow by a factor of two as well. Uh, yeah, there's one more question. You can type there, Rodrigo. There's no problem. It's because you're a co-host, so you cannot type there in Q&A. Uh, okay. Você pode falar também, se quiser, Rodrigo. Abrir o seu microfone para falar. Okay, eu posso falar que aqui toque, ok? Sim. <risos> é, what about a star black hole? É, some image é, in the future, é, what do you think about that? É, because this, this black hole é, é, was, uh, é, was in the center é, of the galaxy, ok? But é, stars, é, stars, when, when, when die, é, or collapse into the black hole too. Uh, in the future, what do you think about the image of the black hole from collapse of the stars? Okay, so, so let me just make sure I understand. So are you asking about the black hole in the center of our galaxy or are you asking about using the EHT to image solar mass black holes that are from collapsed stars? Oh, if if, yes, uh, if uh, it is possible to uh, to do some image of a uh, star black hole uh, in the future will be will be will be uh, done this this kind of image of the black hole of the star black hole 
as as you did uh, as the, the 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 team did with uh, uh, Black Hole in the center of the galaxy. Okay, so we are working on the image for the black hole in the center of our galaxy. The image we've published is for the black hole in the center of the M87 galaxy. The black hole in the center of our own galaxy is more complicated for two main reasons. One is that we have to look through half the galaxy to look at it. So we have to deal with uh, interstellar scattering, which poses a significant problem for us. Um, it's not dominant at 1.3 millimeters, but it's still a significant concern we're still working hard on that. We have the data, we're, we're just trying to, to deal with these problems. Um, the second aspect, which is something that I've worked on a lot during my PhD thesis, is the fact that uh, since variability will scale with mass, the black hole in the center of our galaxy is about a thousand times smaller than the black hole in the center of M87. And so because of that, it's going, all of the variability is gonna happen about a thousand times faster. And that's really, really important because with a, a very long baseline interferometer, which is what the EHT is, it takes us about 12 hours to collect enough data to be able to make an image. And during those 12 hours, we're literally waiting for the Earth to rotate. So we can't possibly make that faster um, unless we go to space. And so during those 12 hours, M87 doesn't really do anything, right? It's practically constant um, during those 12 hours. But for Sag star, the time scale for variability could be on the order of an hour or even less uh, if it's rapidly spinning. And so for Sag star, the variability poses uh, a new set of problems that we have to deal with. And so we're still working on that, but, but um, we do have the data in hand. Um, it's just that it is a more challenging source to image than M87. Okay. And then for, sorry, can I can answer the other? No, okay, I, uh, 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 okay, no problem. I understand. Um, I was going to answer about stellar mass black holes too, though. Okay. Uh, we can't observe those because they are way too small for our resolution. Um, there's no. The, the, the horizon. The horizon is very large too, or not? For solar mass black holes. For the star, no. Okay. For solar mass black holes, no. So the for black holes from the collapse of stars, they're way too small for the EHD. And then we'd also have to to solve. You know how I was talking about how we picked the wavelength to observe at based on the sources we were going to look at. Those two sources, M87 and Sag A star, are perfect at 1.3 millimeters. But for solar mass black holes, we'd have to do that exercise all over again, and it might not be um, possible to do very long baseline interferometry at the perfect wavelength for these smaller mass black holes. And so we would not only, not only are they too small, but the wavelength that our instrument operates at probably wouldn't work. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Leah, if you have an extra time, I guess one question from the YouTube. Uh, so. Uh, and there is uh, another question in Q&A again. Oh, okay, so they are asking if um, would it be a good prospect to detect deviations from GR if the supermassive black hole co coalesce with solar masses black hole with its accretion disk? So, okay, so yes, that would be an awesome test, but we probably wouldn't be able to ever observe that with the EHT. So. So let me take this a step back. So coalescing black holes are really, really interesting to test GR, but they're probably better to test GR with gravitational wave observatories. And so the current observatories that we have probably won't be able to detect uh, a small black hole going into a really big black hole, but there's hope that with future ob observatories, we might be sensitive to that as well. And that would create a really, really awesome um, test of general relativity in a different way than what we've been doing so far. Um, those uh, problems are actually really hard to simulate when you have a really large difference between your two black holes and you're trying to simulate their coalescence. That's much more complicated for numerical reasons than if you have two black holes that are about the same size. And so there's obviously some, um, some difficulties that are still being worked on in the gravitational wave community to, to really get um, a good understanding of what happens when that happens. The reason why I have very little hope that the EHT will be able to observe that is that um, 
with our resolution and the fact that we only observe for five nights a year, the statistically the chances of us catching something like that for these two black holes that we can observe is just way too low. Um, it, the chances of it actually happening for, for the EHT are, are really, really low. And even if it did, I'm not sure what would happen. Um, it'd be interesting to, to see a simulation of that, right? So I don't, I don't, as far as I know, I don't think anybody's done a full simulation where they have a full accretion disk around a black hole and um, a small black hole going through the accretion disk and falling into the bigger black hole. Um, you know, including all of the physics, I don't think that's necessarily possible, but there, but it, there might be um, some simulations that have simplified the problem a little bit and maybe we're able to do something like that. So I don't know what would happen, but it might create like some sort of really big explosion or some sort of um, flare um, for that black hole. So it's possible that we would see something, um, but whether or not we would be able to tell that it was a black hole falling into another black hole, I'm not sure because we see flares from, from these black holes fairly frequently. And statistically, the, the chances of those being like actual little black holes falling in is quite low. And so I think it could be an interesting test of GR, but I think we're gonna have to wait for things like LISA uh, or the Einstein telescope to be able to do that um, with gravitational waves, not probably not with the EHD. Okay, so as a, a last question, uh, there is one here in Q and A asking what kind of tests we can keep doing to confirm GR with black holes. Good question. Um, uh, so many, but also <laughs> given that we've only just started uh, being able to do this at all, the fact that we are able to do two tests. I think is already incredible. So, so two is already a lot more than, than what we had just a few years ago, which was zero, right? So, so I guess what I wanna say is that right now we have two ways of using black holes to test GR. Um, I view this as really just the beginning. I think that it's gonna get better for both of these um, in the future. I think that gravitational waves right now are doing really awesome tests with LIGO and Virgo. But as I just mentioned with Lisa, I think we'll be able to do much more exciting tests um, that will be testing different areas of the parameter space because with LIGO and LISA, we're looking at solar mass black holes, but sorry, with LIGO and Virgo, we're looking at solar mass black holes, but with LISA, we'd be looking at much bigger black holes. So that could be really interesting. As far as the EHT is concerned, um, I think it's really just the beginning for the EHT because that was just our very first uh, image. And we only had six telescopes and now we're gonna observe with nine telescopes, again, pandemic permitting, but that is a really, really huge difference for an interferometer. So we're gonna be able to constrain our image hopefully much better. And what's really important too, is that um, one of the ways that we can make sure that what we're observing is really a gravitational feature and not an astrophysical artifact is by comparing um, what the image looks like uh, as a function of time. Right, so if you remember in my simulations, there's a lot of variability going on, but there's this little ring that's perfectly constant while everything else varies. And so if you measure a ring that has the same size every year, you're gonna be more confident that what you're measuring is really the gravitational feature, specifically the black hole shadow. But if it seems to be changing as a function of time, then you should be really concerned and you're probably not measuring the black hole shadow. So one way that you know this test of gravity is going to improve is the fact that we're going to be able to do this uh, over several years and become more certain about what we're really looking at. And also, obviously, with these more telescopes, with the additional telescopes. But the other aspect of this, too, is, again, if you remember from my simulations, um, the simulations that had a bunch of different colors, uh, if you remember, the rings were always white. And that's really, really important. That just means that the ring is a feature that you would be able to see over a wide range of wavelengths. Okay, so we call we say that it's achromatic. It doesn't depend on wavelength. And so if that's true, which we expect it to be, we um, we should observe at different wavelengths to check whether or not we see the same sized ring. And that is something that we are actively working on. We are actively uh, improving our telescopes or adding on to our telescopes. And we hope to be able to observe at 0.87 millimeters um, in the near future. I think there's a test that might happen in 2021, but we're not really going to be able to do full observations until, um, until the following year, I think. 
And so those are you know, a few ways in which uh, these tests of, of gravity will improve. But as far as like a completely new test of gravity using black holes that is not related to imaging a black hole and is not related to gravitational waves, I'm not sure that that's interesting and, um, and I should look into it. But, um, but I think that those are the two main ways that we know of at least right now. Okay. Mia, thank you so much again for this wonderful talk. And uh, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. It was really a pleasure. And uh, if uh, people have more questions, I can email them from, for Leah and uh, uh, she can send me the, the answer and I will send it back to you. So thank you again, Leah, and uh, it was a pleasure. A wonderful time. Thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, now we finished our first day of the International Symposium on Physics. Uh, we are going to go back tomorrow uh, at 8 and 30 a.m. Uh, Brazilian time. And uh, well, I hope you enjoyed the day today and I hope that you have a great day tomorrow too. And uh, it is, it has been a pleasure to be here with all of you guys. So thank you so much for people who is watching us at YouTube, for people who is watching us here uh, in Zoom. And uh, I hope to see you again tomorrow. Okay, so thank you everyone and have a good night.